plot, character and theme are the- <laughs> Okay, no, I'm not doing that. When it comes to the history of science fiction, Doctor Who is one of the most influential yet consistently overlooked properties. Nearly 60 years old, Doctor Who has told one long continuous story about a mysterious time and space traveller known simply as the Doctor, who travels throughout the universe in their TARDIS, saving people and planets from evil, aided by their allies and friends, often known as companions, who act as relatable figures for the viewers to project themselves onto. The Doctor can change their appearance and personality to evade death, which has allowed the show to consistently experiment and change over the years shifting with current events and media trends so it can remain timeless and always evolve with a constant flow of new writers, actors and storylines to keep the franchise relevant. What started as a 1960s educational sci-fi family show is now arguably Britain's biggest media franchise, spawning books, comics, spin-offs and thousands of audio dramas. Doctor Who has been referenced and parodied endlessly, with the TARDIS becoming more famous than the police boxes it was based on. Doctor Who may not be as financially valuable as franchises like Star Star Wars or Star Trek, but the sheer influence and recognisability of Doctor Who makes it just as culturally relevant, at least in the UK. But despite enjoying over half a century of success, Doctor Who has found itself in a rough spot for the last five or so years. Even though the TV show was revived in 2005 after a 16 year absence, the departures of showrunner Russell T Davis and actor David Tennant began a cultural shift as many fans and viewers started to drift away from the show. Something worsened after the climactic 50th anniversary special and regeneration of Matt Smith's 11th Doctor into Peter Capaldi's 12th Doctor. This change brought with it falling ratings along with a sharp rise in arguments and toxicity within the fanbase. A number of polarising creative decisions have caused Doctor Who to drop out of the public consciousness and and become more of a cult classic rather than the juggernaut it was between 2005 and 2013. Even though a number of these issues began under showrunner Stephen Moffat, the punching bag and face of this downfall is his successor Chris Chibnall. Chibnall's era of Doctor Who between 2017 and 2022 has been incredibly controversial and volatile. He attempted a soft reboot of the show with series 11, before rewriting the Doctor's entire origin story in series 12. Along with this, he broke tradition by casting Jodie Whittaker as the first ever official female incarnation of the Doctor. Doctor, which caused an uproar amongst certain fans who believe the character should only be played by men. Whilst I can never agree with that argument, I've always been pretty vocal about my own dislike of this period of the show. I grew up with Doctor Who. I was 5 years old when I sat down to watch Rose on the 26th of March 2005 and I never looked back since. I got magazines, trading cards, toys, I read the books. I was Doctor Who crazy. Now I don't have any footage of me and a Dalek, but here's a photo of 14 year old Harbo and my cyber GF at the Doctor Who experience. It was our first date. Doctor Who has been a part of my world for as long as I can remember and it has helped me through thick and thin, which has allowed me to develop my own understanding of what makes Doctor Who magic and unique. It's a show unlike any other with limitless potential and appeal. You can go from the highest highs of jubilation to crying your eyes out no matter how old or tough you are. It constantly pushes ahead to reach entire new generations who can grow up with this endless universe which makes it more than just a show. Doctor Who has created some of the most memorable moments on television with incredible characters and very experimental relevant storylines. Whilst these things elevate it and make it the greatest TV show in history, they're not the most important important thing for me as a viewer. It's actually a lot simpler than that. At its core, Doctor Who is a goofy and fun show catapulting the viewer throughout space and time to battle fearsome enemies. If it can achieve this basic feeling, allowing me to curl up on the sofa and travel the universe like a starry-eyed child, then I can consider it a success. All the characters, plots and themes are simply a welcome bonus to enhance the experience. The most important part is simply feeling like Doctor Who. The Chibnall era wasn't able to do this. I just couldn't feel that same childlike joy and investment I felt for all those years between Series 1 and my personal favourite, Series 9. Series 11 and 12 lost the magic of Doctor Who for me, with weak characters, poor writing and bad creative decisions. But then Doctor Who Flux came along. The 13th series of the show was a huge break from modern traditions. Rather than a series of 10 to 13 episodes mixing anthology and serialisation, Flux is a fully connected six part narrative drama serial. And it was fresh something bold and brand new. By creating a six week journey, Flux delivered something the modern era of Doctor Who has never done before. But was it enough to salvage this era that has never truly found its footing? Could it restore the magic of the show? Well buckle in because this is my biggest adventure yet. It's time to dive deeper than I've ever dived before and ask the question, is Flux the redemption of Doctor Who? Part 1 A Marketing Disaster 
Probably the biggest problem with Flux is the absolutely atrocious marketing campaign. This is something they still haven't improved on, with Series 12 having equally anonymous marketing. In 2018, you knew Doc 2 Series 11 was coming. There was a lot of advertising and promotion hyping up the exciting new era. However, with Series 13, the marketing was purposefully restrictive, which damaged the public perception of the series and the show as a whole. A large amount of the general public had no idea there was a new Doc 2 series this year. Everything was overshadowed by the announcements of Chibnall and Jodie leaving in 2022, along with the reveal of Russell T Davis returning to the show the following year. These things completely overshadowed the Series 13 marketing campaign because it hadn't even started yet. Let's take a look at the timeline of the most botched series marketing in all of Doctor Who. November 11th, 2020. Series 13 officially enters production, filming finally beginning after the easing of COVID restrictions. January 1st, 2021. John Bishop is introduced as new companion Dan, introduced in a post credit scene after Revolution of the Daleks. Then, nothing. Not a single piece of official information about Series 13 until July. Seven months with no cast announcements, no promo images, or any production information. The BBC remain completely quiet and fans are left to speculate for weeks each time there's a new grainy set photo taken by a passerby. This is the main issue. The fans had to do the marketing themselves. It was up to Twitter accounts and YouTubers to hype up the series completely independently because the BBC wouldn't even acknowledge the existence of Series 13. This allows rumours and misinformation to spread like wildfire. Tabloids spouting unsubstantiated nonsense about Donna or Captain Jack returning and made up Reddit leaks treated as gospel. People just generally didn't know what the hell was going on. As I said, this lasts for seven months and caused a lot of infighting within online communities. This all changes on July 25th, with a San Diego Comic Con panel all about Series 13. This is the first time since January 1st that any official information is released, and there's a lot of it. Chibnall reveals that Series 13 will be a six-part single story, Game of Thrones alumni Jacob Anderson is announced as recurring character Vinda, and we get a couple of promo images, alongside a short 40-second teaser trailer. It's an exciting day, given the staffed community plenty to talk about and speculate on, no longer having to rely solely on these random set reports. It's a promising time feeling like a turning point in communication between the BBC and the fans. Except, it isn't, because the series falls completely silent for another two months. The closest thing to Series 13 marketing being a badly paced and disappointing ARG throughout August and September. This brings the radio silence to a total of around 276 days out of the 279 between January 1st and October 7th. Only three days of marketing for possibly the biggest BBC show's next series with an ambiguous 2021 release date. A window growing smaller and smaller by the day without any indication of a release date. I don't think I need to tell you why that's concerning. The BBC's obsession with keeping secrets even leads to an embarrassing moment of John Bishop getting into trouble for saying his character is from Liverpool. No, I'm not joking. That's actually something that happened. Alongside former showrunner Stephen Moffat being the one to accidentally formally announce the return of the Weeping Angels, rather than, you know, the actual current production team. This is not a good look for the show. But I would like to apologise for blowing the return of the Weeping Angels. Uh, I really didn't mean to do that. I am tremendously sorry. But now you've all seen in the trailer, you know they're there. However, everything finally kicked off on the 8th of October. All Doctor Who social media and website content completely deleted, including the announcement of the Season 17 Blu-ray box set, which had been revealed just a day before. Oops. It's a bold strategy, marketing your show by completely erasing the fact your show exists. I'm not sure where they got that idea from, but it definitely created a buzz amongst people who were already going to watch Series 13 anyway. Like, did they think James who stopped watching in 2010 is suddenly going to run around telling his friends Doctor Who has been wiped from the internet? It's such a bizarre way to generate buzz, especially because everything is restored the very next day. And it wasn't even like things came back alongside a trailer, release date and information. Those all came hours later. Yes, on the 9th of October we finally got some proper information again. Series 13 was revealed to have the name Flux and we're given the release date after 10 months of waiting. It's Halloween. Wait, in three weeks time? This wasn't much notice. It makes sense to be given a full trailer so close to release, but we were only told when the show would air three weeks before it first began transmission. Again, this is not how to build hype for something, especially a flagship show with dwindling ratings after a non-existent marketing campaign the year before. Even the full one minute trailer was dropped on the Graham Norton show at 10.55pm on a Friday night. 
Jodie Whittaker barely able to talk about the series, so the whole thing felt more like the BBC were only advertising Series 13 because they were legally required to, so they waited until the last possible moment. Indeed, between the 15th and the 31st, there were almost daily drops of new promo pictures and interviews, as if the marketing team suddenly remembered they needed to fill a quota, so spilled all their load at once. Within the span of 10 or so days, Flux went from comically under-advertised to almost painfully over-advertised, images of seemingly every single extra to even step foot on the set of any episode. However, the true low of the lead up to Flux came on the 28th of October, when TV guys came out unable to properly preview the Halloween apocalypse. Instead of a proper write-up advertising the episode, publications instead provided scathing, passive-aggressive notes calling out the BBC for their obsession with secrecy. If there's one single thing to sum up the disastrous marketing of Series 13, it's these previews, or lack thereof. Secrecy is important for modern Doctor Who, with huge twists like the John Sim Master in Series 10 being spoiled by advertising. It makes sense to crack down on these kinds of spoilers, but the BBC took it way too far during the Chibnall era by keeping everything completely silent. The Weeping Angels and the Santarans were already public knowledge, so you may as well just announce them to capitalise on the leaks and maintain intrigue by getting more casual eyes on the series much earlier on. Exactly what they did with Series 12's Jadoon to get ahead of these kinds of filming leaks. There were plenty of secrets worth keeping, but the BBC acted like every single nanosecond of flux needed to be hidden, and that led to it being comically under-advertised because nobody was allowed to know anything until the last minute. Viewing figures for Flux continued the downward trend of Series 11 and 12, and I think the advertising is one of the biggest culprits. The fully serialised format was something brand new for the modern version of the show, providing the perfect hook for advertising, but the secrecy and stubborn refusal to actually market the series means nobody knew it was even there. So great job BBC, you once again failed to market your single biggest IP, and I don't think anyone is surprised that this happened as a result. You don't have to show spoilers, but you can at least acknowledge the series exists before the last possible opportunity, right? Ah, uh, who am I kidding, this is the BBC we're talking about. Part 2. Filming in a Pandemic Unless you've been living under a rock, you might know 2020 was a horrific year. The entire world was crippled by the Covid pandemic. In order to prevent the spread of disease, countries around the world went into lockdowns, keeping everyone inside and closing down hospitality and entertainment industries. Doctor Who Series 13 was originally supposed to begin pre-production in June and start filming in September. This didn't happen for obvious reasons, and the episode count was slashed to 8, which was then further split into 6 episodes and 3 specials, leading to a complete overhaul of the series structure. Executive producer Matt Strevens has admitted as such, saying that Flux was a very late development, so it's really impressive that they were able to scramble to create such a completely different plan than they were originally aiming for. It wasn't until the entertainment industry reopened under heavy restrictions that Doctor Who could actually begin production which in turn brought with it a myriad of issues. There was constant testing required, and the crews had to be smaller a lot of the time. These kinds of restrictions were easier to handle with studio-bound shows like game shows or panel shows, but it's a lot harder to film a big drama spanning multiple sets and locations with a huge cast and crew. I feel like this is important to keep in mind when it comes to Flux. You can see the influence with a lot of scenes having only a few actors on screen at a time, all conveniently distanced. But I think the production team did an absolutely incredible job to bring the show to life with so much going against them. The series still manages to look fantastic, apart from some pretty suspect CGI and effects work at times. It maintains the expansive nature of the show, with incredible location filming despite never even being able to leave the country. I honestly think you wouldn't even know it was filmed in the middle of a pandemic, so the cast and crew deserve a lot of respect for taking on this challenging new style of production and actually pulling it off, along with the series being a brand new type of series unseen before in modern Doctor Who. Part 3 – A New Format what sets Doctor Who Flux apart from the previous 12 series is that it's an entirely serialised story, the longest of its kind since the Series 3 finale, which was a three-parter. And no, before you try pointing it out, neither trilogy in Series 9 and 10 actually counts according to the BBC themselves. The closest the modern show would come to fully serialised storytelling like Flux was Series 6, although that was stunted by a confusing overall narrative and the fact it included more traditional standalone Doctor Who stories mixed into things. Hell, even Trial of a Time Lord in 1986 was basically four different serials strung together as an overall story. Instead of this kind of storytelling, Flux attempts to blend serialisation with Doctor Who traditions like Monster of the Week episodes. If you really boil it down, it's kind of like a big finish box set. Just look at War of the Santarans. 
The narrative begins and ends in that story, but it's not a standalone pure Santaran story. The episodes run directly into one another, there's a cliffhanger every single time. Something they're not really standalone because they all need context to be truly enjoyable, otherwise you won't know what's going on. Linking episodes in this way can make for very compelling viewing in the long term, but it's also a big risk because it makes individual episodes less memorable. You can go up to any Doctor You fan and ask for their favourite episode in, say, Series 4, and they'll have an answer because the episodes stand on their own and you can pop them on at any time. But with Flux, it's a wider story, so it runs the risk of diluting the magic of Doctor Who being such a varied and creative show. Sure, you have episodes like War of the Santarans, which can somewhat stand on their own, but then you won't know about the beginning, any of the Flux or Swarm stuff, so it would be a bit confusing. The IP prides itself on anthological storytelling, but Flux follows the footsteps of classic Who serials like the Daleks' Master Plan, with one single sprawling story exploring different plots and locations, although thankfully there isn't a modern version of the Feast of Stephen. Adopting this type of narrative storytelling is both a step forward and a step back for the show. In the modern TV landscape, people love these kinds of serialised stories. Netflix completely revolutionised the medium by releasing narrative dramas all at once for people to binge. But the problem with the popularity of this style is that there's somewhat of an expectation for shows to be 8 hour movies you can just burn through without singling out specific episodes or releasing weekly. This becomes detrimental for Flux because episodes were released weekly rather than all at once like people have become used to with these kinds of shows. It meant Chapter 1 had to introduce a lot of plot threads and do a lot of exposition without actually paying anything off for weeks. It's the first sixth of a narrative with a lot of setup so that the other five parts can continue the beats at a much smoother pace such as War of the Santarans. This episode splits the main cast before reuniting them at the end. The Doctor handles the more traditional narrative as she battles the Santarans in the past, Dan continues the modern day storyline, while Shiaz becomes embroiled in the Vinder and Swarm storylines. It weaves the plots together by the end in a really satisfying way. This technique of front loading the opening episode works fine when you can immediately jump to the next part like all the streaming shows, but when the Halloween Apocalypse was released, there were a lot of complaints about the exposition and the setup, since you literally couldn't get answers for at least another 7 days. It had to introduce the Flux, Swarm, Dan, Vinder and a bunch of other stuff all within the opening episodes, which would have always been a difficult thing to juggle. However, I think this organised chaos was actually a good thing. Why? Because it got people talking. That's the difference between weekly and binge release methods. With shows released all at once, people talk about it for a couple of days before moving on because you can only discuss it with people who have already finished, otherwise you end up getting spoiled. But when a show releases weekly, people talk. Just look at how huge Game of Thrones became because it came out each week fueling speculation and theories by the water coolers. A weekly release structure creates discussion because people are on a level playing field. Disney has nailed this with shows like The Mandalorian, WandaVision and Loki because everyone was taking each step of the journey together at the very same time. It's great for communities and allows the show to last longer in the public consciousness. People can actually engage with other people regarding the show. Even though the Halloween apocalypse had a few too many plot threads being introduced, it gave fans plenty to talk about and speculate on, which is something that continued every single week as more mysteries came up and we slowly received answers for other mysteries. There was so much going on that it created the perfect breeding ground for all this discourse, drawing viewers in by withholding payoffs until further down the line. You wanted to find out about the Flux, find out who Swarm is, find out how the Division are related to everything. You wanted to see what that random house at the beginning of War of the Santarans was. There was something in every single episode that made people talk. And 7 days is pretty much the perfect length of time for theories to be discussed. Like, people came up with theories about Rose returning because a space station was named Rose and Dan had a wallpaper of roses on it. You just can't get that when everyone has already seen the show within the first day. I feel like a lot of people found themselves struggling to adapt to the new style of episodic serialisation. This led to some fans criticising a lot of episodes as if they were standalone stories, rather than being part of a wider narrative. Sure, there are plenty of issues with each episode and the Halloween Apocalypse is definitely a messy opener, but everything has a purpose in the grand scheme of things. It's not throwing everything onto the screen at 100 miles per hour like the Rise of Skywalker. Yes, people actually made that comparison. But unlike Rise of Skywalker, these plot threads actually go somewhere and have time to breathe. The Halloween Apocalypse has three clear plots. 
You have the A plot, which focuses on Calvinista and Dan, along with Claire's section being spun off from a scene within this plot. Then you have the B plot, where Swarm returns to the universe and reunites with his sister Azure. Lastly, you have the C plot, which is the beginning of the titular flux as different entities like Vinda and the Santarans react to its emergence. When you separate the narrative off into these boxes, it's actually quite neat and straightforward. Sure, it could have been handled a little bit better with the trimming of some scenes and the complete removal of the irrelevant 1820 Liverpool scene, but it still works perfectly well as a narrative. Once you distill the episode down to its three plot threads, you can counter the criticisms that nothing of substance happened within the narrative. The A plot has a clear beginning, middle and end. The Doctor has an enemy to chase, which puts her on a collision course with new companion Dan, and it also allows her to pick up pieces of the wider puzzle since Carvinista is related to the Division and knows all about the Flux because that's the true reason he's here. It's a completely normal Doctor Who story, it just has everything else added on. The ending of the episode is directly related to what came before because the Doctor now helps Carvinista and his people shield the planet from the Flux, but this in turn leaves her on the wrong side of the barrier, allowing for Swarm to direct the Flux at the TARDIS. See how all three of these plot threads come together? It's the perfect blend of the old style we're used to and the new style of modern serialisation. It has a clear central plot with other side stories happening at the same time, which also all got paid off in due course, so it sets up all the important aspects of the series whilst maintaining the show's core identity, and this is something that continues throughout as every episode still felt like Doctor Who, whilst keeping this story going in an engaging way. The modern TV audience has slowly been developing a reliance on binge culture for heavily serialised stories. I know it might be controversial to say, but I think people have forgotten how to cope with a slow burn story. You just expect to jump into the second episode so you don't really notice or think about the structure of the opening. A lot of fans compared the Halloween Apocalypse to a glorified 51 minute trailer, but that's kind of the point. This isn't like modern Doctor Who used to be. You can't compare it to episodes like Rose or the 11th Hour because those were self-contained stories. They didn't need to set up a further five episodes immediately afterwards. To succeed as a narrative drama, you have to drop teasers and serve up appetizers for future plot threads to maintain intrigue, even if at times it creates a feeling of bouncing around. Just look at the first episode of Game of Thrones, back before binge culture was a thing. The episode has four different locations appearing, the main two being Pentos and Winterfell, each containing a completely parallel and unrelated story to each other. It throws a lot at you with plenty of exposition, but people didn't have any issues with this because, well, it was 2011. Even in 2016 with Stranger Things Season 1 Episode 1, there is a lot of parallel storytelling with different character points of views and loads of things being set up. You have a random monster at the beginning, Will disappearing, Eleven escaping a lab, Joyce coming across strange electronic phenomena, and lastly Will's three friends coming across Eleven in the woods. It joins two of its three plots together at the end, but there's still a lot unanswered. People didn't care though because you just move on to the next six episodes that were released on the very same day. You don't need time to process it or wait for the pieces to fall into place. Doctor Who Flux is a lot bigger in scope than Stranger Things. Rather than a small town in America, it spans all of time and space, so naturally there would be a lot more locations to set up and it would take a lot longer for things to come together. Similar to Game of Thrones tossing you between the Wall, Pentos, Winterfell and King's Landing, a lot of Doctor Who viewers weren't ready for a lack of immediate answers, which they perceived as a problem with the series rather than it simply being a weekly show gradually exploring and solving a mystery. You can't really judge the storytelling structure of a book by its introductory chapter, so why do it for the first sixth of a TV series? Of course it wouldn't give everything away at once, because it's designed to be a wider experience. You can criticise the dialogue, editing or acting because they're all heavily flawed, but a lot of people made a mountain out of a molehill when it came to the pacing of chapter 1 because it wasn't nearly as bad as they made it seem. It's quite telling that the most popular and generally praised episodes of Flux were War of the Centaurans and Village of the Angels since they were already going to be in Series 13, so they were simply repurposed for the serialised format. These two episodes are very streamlined, with the typical Doctor Who narrative taking precedent. Village of the Angels is almost entirely standalone, with the exception of the bell scenes, so you don't need too much context to watch it. It's a straightforward Weeping Angel story with everything you'd expect from an episode involving those monsters. It it doesn't end as conclusively as War of the Centaurans, but the general structure of it remains the same. In a way, these two episodes are almost anchors, keeping viewers engaged without losing them too much. It's actually common practice for Doctor Who to do this. In Series 1, Dalek was intentionally placed halfway through to prop up the series viewership-wise in case it sagged in the middle, which is why the reveal was given away in the title, because it would immediately garner attention. 
By having War of the Centaurans second and Flux, it prevents too many viewers being alienated by Halloween Apocalypse, and the same goes for Village of the Angels and Once Upon Time. Obviously the ratings show that this approach didn't quite pay off, but from an audience standpoint it helps to settle down the overarching story at times. You know what you're getting into with these, so they're very accessible and that helps make Flux's new format a lot easier to get used to by blending in familiarity. On the other hand, the newly written episodes are a lot less accessible. Once Upon Time in general is rather controversial because it's very experimental. It was sandwiched between those two fairly standalone episodes and was very lore heavy with an express focus on the wider storyline. The presentation of jumping around timelines is intentionally confusing to show how out of depth the Doctor is and it's very expositional. A lot of people criticised it for adding more questions without offering any answers, but I actually think it provides plenty of answers to existing mysteries. We learned who Vinder is, what Swarm wants, why the flux actually happened, how the division is related, and how Carvinista knows the Doctor. We find out what happened to Diane and who Passenger is, along with seeing the most recent battle between Swarm and the Doctor, resulting in his imprisonment. Much like the Halloween Apocalypse, the amount of stuff going on made it easy to criticise, but I respect the experimental nature of it since it does try new things. I love seeing the characters playing different roles, like Jodie playing Yaz's partner in the police, or Yaz playing Vinder's superior officer. It creates a really surreal atmosphere which I appreciate, and I think if it was the exact same but with Moffat's name on the credits, a lot more fans would like it, since there are many similarities to episodes like Wedding of River Song and Name of the Doctor. It's understandable why Once Upon Time would be an alienating episode to casual audiences, because you need to have been closely following everything since Fugitive of the Jadoon to actually know what's going on. It shows the inherent risks of heavy serialisation, since you can't just jump into the middle of the series and expect to know what's going on. There's an old theory from the 1930s known as the hypodermic needle model. This was the first attempt to explain how mass audiences react to media, and it claims that viewers passively receive information transmitted by a piece of media, like an injection. The theory dismisses individuality, assuming our behaviour and thinking can easily be changed by media with no attempt to process or challenge what we're experiencing. If your approach to media is like this, Flux would understandably be a confusing mess, because you're only taking it at face value. The series is geared towards people who do think about what they're experiencing, which is a concept referred to as uses and gratifications, a more modern approach where the audience is active and engages with the media they consume. Flux challenges you to put the pieces together yourself. A term I heard a lot after each episode was, well I liked it more when I watched it again. This speaks to the importance of viewing the series as a full serial, rather than individual stories. Things make a lot more sense once you have wider context and when you pay closer attention to certain details, rather than you just sitting there passively and not engaging on a deeper level. It's important to have rewatch value, even if that is just confusing your audience enough to make them watch it for a second time. Unlike most other narrative dramas, Flux actively rewards you for rewatching, since there's always something new to see. The complicated nature of the serial is actually a good thing. Not only does it compel you to revisit an episode immediately after watching it, it also makes you want to re-experience the narrative as a whole with hindsight to get the most out of it and feel gratification. The ending is disappointing because it had too much to resolve, but the journey to get there is a lot of fun and to me that made it worth the investment. Although we'll get to that ending in due course because pretty much everything started going wrong in the second half of the series. Even though I think Flux was a good use of serialised narrative drama, I would be remiss to not mention Torchwood Children of Earth. Much like how Covid limited the filming capabilities of Doctor Who Series 13, Children of Earth was not the initial plan for Torture Series 3, but rather the result of the show being moved to BBC One and inexplicably cut down to just 5 episodes. So the production team chose to adopt a serialised model to make the best out of the limitations enforced upon them. However, that's pretty much where the similarities end. Children of Earth's scale is a lot smaller and more focused than Flux, which is why the series works a lot better. Rather than trying to go big with some universe spanning storyline featuring different time periods and monsters, Children of Earth sticks to the UK with a single alien threat of the 456, only visiting the past for select flashbacks. This makes for a tighter experience similar to most narrative dramas, because a lot of aspects remain consistent without taking on a story too ambitious to carry out. If anything, Flux is a bit more like Miracle Day, which tried to widen the scope by introducing a lot more plot threads and locations. You essentially have three different shows going on at 
the same time. The Flux, the Ravagers and Ace on Tyrone Occupation of Earth are all big enough to be the focus of their own series. Having Series 13 be a tight-knit six-part story all about the invasion of the Santarans would be incredible, with the protagonist stranded on Earth and working with Kate Stewart's resistance. You could even open it up by having a Grand Serpent, Vinder and Bell storyline in space, culminating in these more select and connected plot strands being weaved together. Flux is filled to the brim with concepts and narratives, but they can't really be constrained to a mere six-part story. For example, it took The Expanse two and a half seasons to build to its first climax because it had to spend so long laying the groundwork for such a vast story. Flux, on the other hand, tries to do the same in six episodes, which is always a recipe for disaster. I'm looking at you, Game of Thrones Season 8. None of this is to say Flux is bad, it's just a little bit too ambitious for its own good, because this plot and format should have encompassed the entire Chibnall era, rather than just showing up at the end like Chibnall finally remembered what he's good at. Part 4, A Showrunner's Last Stand Unlike the transition between Russell T Davis and Stephen Moffat at the end of the 2000s, the departure of Moffat himself in 2017 wasn't smooth at all. He had originally planned to bow out alongside Matt Smith in 2013, but instead ended up staying for three more series. He wasn't even supposed to stay for series 10, since the BBC offered Toby Whithouse a series to bridge the gap between Moffat and Chibnall. On top of this, Moffat couldn't even leave at his third attempt, reluctantly staying to make Twice Upon a Time his actual swan song, all because Chibnall didn't want to start his era with a Christmas special. I mean, when you really look at it, Paul Moffat couldn't even resign on his own terms. This pretty much set the tone for the controversial new era underneath Chibnall, whose appointment was questioned from the very moment it was announced. See, when it came to Davis's replacement, Moffat was the clear choice since he was a regular writer and all his episodes were beloved. But towards the end of the Moffat era, it wasn't nearly as easy to elect a successor. Ultimately, the role was given to former Torchwood head writer Chris Chibnall. Sure, Chibnall had been a regular contributor over the years, writing four Doctor Who stories across the Tenet and Smith eras of the show, but none of these stories were particularly loved like Moffat's. They ranged from bland and forgettable to absolutely awful, so nobody really considered Chibnall a standard out choice. But there was a factor the BBC cared more about, the popularity of Broadchurch. The main reason Chibnall didn't contribute to Doctor Who between 2012 and 2017 was because he was busy writing his most popular project, Broadchurch, an ITV crime drama starring David Tennant and Olivia Colman. Chibnall had wanted to create the show ever since 2003, and his persistence paid off as the show was an immediate hit. Series 1 became the most watched drama on British TV in 2013, and was nominated for 7 BAFTA awards. Series 2 and 3 found similar success, the show becoming a household name, which therefore led to the BBC deciding Chibnall would be a good name to take control of Doctor Who. They were basically clout chasing on the biggest possible scale. They didn't care about its contribution to Doctor Who. He was the biggest name in TV at that precise moment, so he got the job. So, was the Chimnal who sat down to write Doctor Who Series 11 the same Chimnal that was lauded for the serialised Broadchurch full of interests and characters? Well, if it was, there wouldn't be a 5 hour video essay all about his failings in Series 11 and 12. To put it bluntly, Chibnall cannot write traditional Doctor Who. His episodes are rushed, filled with too many undeveloped characters, and it's just bad. It's a topic that has been done to death, so I won't go into it all again. But one of the most common things you'll see regarding Chimnall's Doctor Who is the question, why was his Torchwood and Broadchurch stuff so much better? Well, after months of careful research and deep investigation work, I may have found the definitive answer. That whole time, Chibnall was not in charge. He was never the puppet master. He was actually the puppet. Torchwood Law and Order UK, Broadchurch, Chibnall wrote for all of these shows, but they also have something in common nobody seems to have noticed. Look at this, nestled in the credits. Producer, Richard Stokes. Yes, that's right, Richard Stokes was Chibnall's puppet master this whole time. Obviously I'm joking, but it is an interesting similarity between the three shows. The first two series of Torchwood and Broadchurch are Chibnall's most esteemed writing jobs, and for both of these he had to answer to Stokes. Similarly, unlike Torchwood which showed Chibnall can contribute great stories to the Doctor universe, Stokes did not produce the Chibnall era of Doctor itself, possibly explaining a number of the issues with that period of the show. Instead, Sam Hoyle would produce series 11, and Matt Strevens produced series 11 through 13. Hoyle had only worked with Chibnall as script editor on Camelot on Broadchurch, along with being associate producer on Broadchurch series 3. But Chibnall had not worked with Strevens before. For most writers, this shouldn't be too much of an issue, but I feel as though Chibnall needs to be paired with an executive producer he's familiar with to actually perform to the best of his ability. You can see it in Torchwood itself. 
Series 1 was a rough start before a stronger second series. Then, Chibnall worked with Stokes again on Law & Order before they collaborated for Broadchurch to immediate success. I think being under new producers had a knock-on effect for Chibnall, because he didn't have the same level of understanding or working relationship with Hoyle and Strevens, meaning he wasn't reined in or guided when he actually needed to be. But by the time Series 13 rolled around, he had been working with Strevens for four years, which would explain his improvement in writing because the familiarity was now there, along with the outside circumstances allowing Chibnall to finally write what he writes best, serialised dramas. Now, I won't lie, it was initially a terrifying reveal that Chibnall had written all six episodes of Flux, the only other writer being Maxine Alderton, whose Weeping Angel adventure remained part of the series despite all the changes. Chibnall's sole writing credits in series 11 and 12 were almost all a disaster, so it seemed like we were set for more of the same. But to be honest, he did a good job of Flux, and to put it simply, Flux is basically what we expected back when Chibnall was announced as showrunner. After all, when you hire a writer based on the success of his narrative drama series, it's not really surprising that everyone would expect him to channel that kind of writing. Flux is like Chibnall finally found his Doctor Who footing. Is it perfect? No, of course not, and we'll get into that in a minute. But compared to his previous Doctor Who work, Flux is a breath of fresh air, handling intricate plots and character dynamics, whilst including genuinely funny jokes and memorable moments to create an enjoyable series of Doctor Who that fits into the modern TV landscape of narrative dramas and streaming shows. It's the first time I've laughed with Doctor Who for a long time. In series 11 and 12, I was mainly laughing at it. Suppose... we'll have to have a conversation? Okay. Compare that to this. And also, I wanted to ride a horse. It just works so much better and the improvements to humour help to make Flux incredibly enjoyable. I think it represents growth and development from Chibnall, finally improving his ability to write Doctor Who. However, Flux definitely falls victim to a lot of the existing Chibnall problems we've grown used to over the years. First of all, he still struggles to write realistic dialogue a lot of the time. Me and you're beautiful as your unborn child. Nobody speaks like that. One of my issues with Moffat is that he gave characters unrealistically poetic dialogue, but Chibnall is the polar opposite. A lot of his characters speak like the script was auto-generated by an AI. And it's not like the poor dialogue is masked by other things, because a lot of scenes find themselves still telling rather than showing. The Halloween Apocalypse and Once Upon Time are particularly egregious with this. There's so much narration and exposition which slows them to a crawl at times. Show don't tell is an old saying dating back to at least the early 1900s. As you can guess, it means writers should communicate their stories through actions, thoughts and feelings, rather than using exposition and overly descriptive writing. Chimnall's Doctor episodes have always fallen foul of this advice, with an unbearable level of exposition. Look at the Ghost Monument for example. In this we meet the character Epso, who is a cynical tough man with trust issues stemming from a tragic past. How do we learn all this? He literally sits there and tells us his whole life story. You know, when I was four, my mum told me to climb a tree. It's a full, unbroken scene of pure exposition trying to flesh out this character. This does not make for compelling or even enjoyable television. It's just boring. Even in The Timeless Children, almost the entire episode is the master narrating the truth behind the Doctor's existence like it's an audiobook. However, in comparison, Once Upon Time is a huge improvement with how it delivers backstories. It delves further into the Timeless Child and Division lore, but instead of a character just sitting there telling us everything, the Doctor relives a Division mission from when she was the Fugitive Doctor, actually communicating things through actions rather than dialogue for once. It's the same with Vinda's origin story. We see everything as it happened, rather than him doing what episode did and just telling us everything himself. So it's my firm belief Chibnall finally fixes one of his biggest scripting issues, at least a little bit. But the exposition still weighs down the series so much. There's an absurd level of talking. So many times the series just grinds to a halt for exposition, which becomes very prevalent in the last three episodes. The pacing gets so wonky and slow as the extensive cast of characters stand around trying to explain the plot, but all the techno babble and breathless exposition actually makes the narrative even harder to follow because it's throwing so many words at you. When the Doctor isn't using her sonic screwdriver for literally everything, she's trying to cram a novel's worth of exposition into 30 seconds of a scene. It's excessive, 
tiring and it completely loses you for no reason. It's like when you're talking to someone who is really enthusiastic and passionate about their interests, but none of it actually makes any sense to you, so you just smile and nod along as if you understand what's happening. There is no denying that Chibnall makes significant improvements with Flux. The writing is generally tighter, it's much easier and more fun to watch, but there are so many times it feels like more of the same Chibnall who. All these huge concepts and ideas being turned into boring, personalityless exposition dumps with robotic dialogue. The serialised format plays to Chibnall's strengths, but he still falls into the common problems, which ultimately hurts such a long and connected story because everything starts to mount up towards the end and directly affects the main tentpole storylines of the serial. Part 5 The Ultimate Cataclysm Okay, so we've got pretty far into this video and I still haven't even explained what the titular Flux is. Basically, the Flux is an all-consuming wave of destruction on par with something like Galactus or the Reality Bomb, except this was created by the Doctor's own adoptive mother, Tecteun. But we'll get to that much later. The Flux destroys all without bias or mercy, which makes it a great piece of cosmic horror. We're first introduced to it in the Halloween Apocalypse, where the first Flux event wipes out pretty much the entire known universe. We are actually shown this, which is really good, seeing it all from Vinder's point of view. Even though Chibnall still has it all explained to the Doctor through monologuing, Vinder's side story explicitly shows us what is happening so we can get an idea of scale. This is furthered throughout the series as we get to see the aftermath of the Cataclysm. Seeing obliterated planets and scattered civilizations helps to flesh everything out and communicate the sheer scale of it all. Some planets and systems were completely destroyed, others received a glance in blow so their people can still cling onto the shards of their former homeworlds. It does wonders for world building because we get to see places like Pisano, which has become a cult worshipping the villainous Azure, who is taking advantage of the desperation to harvest people people. Things like this help to establish consequence. It's all well and good to destroy the universe, but you need to show what happens next, and series 13 does that really well. The visuals and scale of destruction reflects the sheer ambition of the serial and the world it builds. However, the Flux Cataclysm doesn't just affect space, it also affects time. Times. It's revealed that all this time, the enigmatic but peaceful Muri have essentially been holding the entire universe together from their temple of Atropos. I mean, their planet is literally called Time, which kind of gives it all away. So when the Flux and the Ravagers cause the great disruption by damaging the temple, there are huge consequences and implications for the wider Doctor universe. It continues to build the stakes even after the initial Flux event is over, representing that threat without needing to constantly show it, along with revealing what the Ravagers are there to do. This destruction of time is a recurring part of the series. Even the TARDIS starts to break down, sprouting doors and leaking weird goop. War of the Centaurans even took away the door for a bit, which is a great visual reminiscent of Father's Day, where the TARDIS becomes a real police box to reflect the damage to the timeline after Rose saved her dad from dying. The TARDIS has always been one of the main symbols of safety in Doctor Who, so when that starts to break down and get messed up, you can understand just how dire things really are, how horrifically wrong the universe is on a deeper level. One of the coolest things about Flux was the simple touch of putting in mid credit scenes and having the logo on Twitter slowly break apart. Small things like this act like the Flux and its effects are even spilling outside into our own reality. This all creates the sense that time itself is the enemy, which is revealed at the end when time shows up as a physical entity worshipped by Swarm and Azure who themselves represent time, compared to the Flux which represents space. It's just a shame that the manifestation of time is pretty much non-existent. I can't even really analyse it or talk about it because there's nothing to say. It's just there and it teases the 13th Doctor's impending regeneration. What was the point? Intrinsically linked to the Flux are the villainous Ravagers. No, not the big Finnish ones. Instead, these are siblings from a different dimension who feed off chaos and want to destroy the universe along with everyone in it. I feel like I can't really talk about them without first addressing their terrible fashion sense. They look very goofy with their robes and even the monster designs themselves look cheap and unconvincing, especially because Swarm goes from looking like this to looking like this. That first one is just so much more sinister and fitting for the tone of the series. 
However, Doctor Who has built a reputation on silly looking monsters and costumes, so the campanista swarm is fine. He and his sister Azure strut around with complete confidence, acted perfectly by their respective actors. So once you look past the visual and the campness, the Ravagers are actually very sinister presences with strong powers. Right from the beginning, they have something over the Doctor, because they're from her past. Due to the Time as Child reveal in Series 12, the Doctor has missing memories dating back to the very beginning of Time Lord Society, because she was a child found on the other side of a portal, and her mysterious regeneration ability became the foundation of the very Time Lords themselves. The Ravagers are from some point in this forgotten history. Like their previous Siege of Atropos during the Fugitive Doctor's time in the secret Time Lord created organisation known as the Division. Swarm has memories the Doctor doesn't have, which gives him a hold over her, and this rightfully terrifies her. He knows how to beat her, but she doesn't even know anything about him. When you look back at historic Doctor Who monsters, the iconic ones have less shine to them because the Doctor has long since learned how to deal with them. She's familiar with the Daleks and Tarans and the Master, even if they don't know how to deal with her. So to completely invert this concept is a genius move that takes advantage of the Doctor's murky past. She finally meets her match in Swarm, and the backdrop of the serial helps to punctuate the significance of such a villain. In a way, the Doctor vs Swarm is kind of like Order vs Chaos. The 13th Doctor is a symbol of structure, fighting to maintain a sense of order in the universe. But then opposite her is this completely chaotic figure with unlimited power and the simple desire to watch the universe burn. Which is why Tectarian unleashed him to destroy time itself. Even if it's unintentional, the Ravagers contrast the Doctor's lack of control by constantly dictating the narrative. Before the Doctor can find out about her past and the Division, the Ravagers come strolling in and kill Tectarian without hesitation. Now if that's not a power move, I don't know what is. The villains are always one step ahead, taking advantage of every situation to further their own means. It doesn't matter where the Doctor is, they can use a psychic link to taunt her, or even follow her to the gap between universes. So they feel like true big stakes villains worthy of this kind of blockbuster narrative. Even when they're not the focus of an episode like chapter 4 and 5, they're still in the background subjugating the masses. So they're a great, consistent presence throughout, coming and going as they please and leaving a merciless trail of destruction in their wake. But what actually do the Ravagers want? In all the chaos and exposition of the series, it's hard to properly piece together their motivations without needing to visit TARDIS wiki or rewatch episodes multiple times. But once you work it all out, it actually does make a lot of sense and rationalises their actions throughout the series. Swarm and Azure besieged the secret Temple of Atropos in the final Battle of the Dark Times in the distant past, which was before the time was bound time in the anchoring of the thread. It's all weird faction paradox stuff. Ignore it in your existence or be a lot smoother. The Ravagers banished the Mori and tried to hold the temple themselves so they could rule time because they didn't want the Time Lords having that power. However, the Doctor and the Division stopped them, imprisoning Swarm whilst Azure was forced to assume a human identity and live a chameleon arched life to make it impossible for the pair to communicate or discover one another. But in order to ensure the Doctor couldn't stop the Flux, Tectone allowed Swarm to escape, so he and Azure could destroy time whilst the Cataclysm destroyed space. The Flux damaged the Temple of Atropos and allowed the Ravagers to cause the Great Disruption by using Yaz and Vinda to unlock the remaining Mori Guardians. Because all of time itself runs through the Temple, this disruption damaged the entire universe causing chaos and unleashing the previously contained Time Force, which kills anyone it touches. After this, Azure collected survivors at Pisano, putting them inside the passenger form so that she and Swarm could harvest their spatial energy. By combining the Time Force with the spatial energy and the reactivator psychic link between Swarm and the Doctor, the Ravagers are able to transport themselves to where the Doctor is currently located, which is the division ship within the void between two universes. They proceed to get revenge on Tectaeon for what the division did to them, along with continuing to resent the Doctor for her her role in stopping them in the past. Now that they control the Flux, they intend to constantly loop the event by ending it at Atropos, forcing the Doctor to relive it and feel the destruction every time. Destroying Atropos will also free Time itself, which is an entity held within the temple who Swarm and Azure worship. They also bring the Doctor as a sacrifice to the entity, but because the Flux is stopped, Time kills its two disciples for their failure. It's a weird ending to the whole Ravager storyline. Sure, it all makes sense on paper, but in execution, their whole plan is very badly explained. So much of it is brilliant. These ancient enemies who tease the Doctor with her forgotten memories and threaten to destroy them outright. But all of this huge potential gets lost in the chaos 
chaotic mix of everything. The Ravagers have such a small presence in the last two episodes, and because of everything else in the finale, they just feel like they're in the background and all this history of the Doctor goes nowhere. Their part in the narrative ends with a barely audible whimper, and it feels like frustrating mispotential. They spend so much time talking and spouting exposition based threats, that the series almost runs out of time to defeat them, so they just get disintegrated without the Doctor playing any proper part in their fate. It's a really weak note for such a major part of the series to end on. Part 6 – Cast vs Characterization Regardless of whether or not you think Flux managed to end on a high, it's undeniable that it has the best characterization of the Chibnall era. Obviously there wasn't much competition, but the characters of Flux are a lot more engaging and interesting. Each supporting cast is really good. Obviously there's the internet favourite Carvinista, the talking humanoid dog who feels straight out of the Davis era. Then there's Mary Seacole and General Logan, who represent the duality of the human race in the Doctor Who universe. On one hand you have a benevolent character risking her life to save others and not discriminating between the patients she cares for, justifying the Doctor's support of her. But then on the other hand, Logan is stubborn, cowardly and commits literal war crimes by blowing up the retreat in Santarans. So when you combine the two, they're a personification of the Doctor's moral dilemma about whether the human race even deserves saving. I do think Chimel deserves more credit for supporting characters than Flux. They're really well characterised, like Jericho, one of the most popular side characters from the series. Kevin McNally is absolutely phenomenal as this professor fascinated by all this chaos because of the scientific and educational opportunities. He's a joy to watch with so many great comedic moments and he just fits in perfectly. Flux is full of these really interesting and developed characters. So so the show thrives even when the Doctor isn't on screen. The individual characters of Flux are better than the rest of the Chibnall era. They're fun to watch and feel well characterised on the surface, but the biggest Chibnall issue still remains. They have no actual depth to them. He wants to write all these exciting grand adventures full of monsters and mayhem, but he almost reluctantly writes characters because he has to, rather than him wanting to. He doesn't take the time to explore the personal effects of events in his stories. There's an absolutely hilariously bad moment in Revolution of the Daleks where Ryan approaches the Doctor after they have been apart for a year, with the Doctor fresh out of jail still trying to come to terms with her entire sense of self in history being completely pulled out from underneath her. And do you know what happens in this interaction? And how do you feel about that? This single line sums up Chimnall's failure at writing character journeys and struggles. In Flux, Yaz has almost no reaction to seeing the Doctor again after three years apart. Dan doesn't develop an edge after being kidnapped, almost being killed by aliens, having his love interest kidnapped, being stranded in 1901. None of these events are shown to affect his personality. Russell T Davis and Stephen Moffat constantly gave their characters emotions and evolutions. We saw their personalities shift and their reactions to the trauma they went through. There was always a human heart to it. But in Flux, everyone is just kind of cold and distant on an emotional level. But what about the most important character of Doctor Who? The Doctor. Is she well characterised this time? I think it's safe to say that the 13th Doctor is one of the most divisive incarnations of the character. A lot of people dislike her, with some reasons more valid than others. I personally consider her the weakest of the modern era because of her muddled morality and CBBC presenter way of speaking. You get episodes where she locks spiders into an airtight room to slowly suffocate because it's apparently more humane. It's grown too big. She's suffocating. Uh, well then it's a mercy killing. I don't see any mercy in you. And then there's that infamous moment where she decides that the suitable way to stop the master is to expose his darker skin colour so the Nazis will arrest him. Yes, because that's exactly what a hero would do. Facial perception filter. Very easy to jam. Now they'll see the real you. Racism! I just found it really hard to get invested in the 13th Doctor in series 11 and 12. Everything felt so muddled and the weird morality issues were never turned into some kind of character arc, so it made even less sense. The 13th Doctor is basically a manipulative, gaslighting psychopath and is completely unintentional. She's meant to be this bubbly, socially awkward character. I should say a reassuring thing now, shouldn't I? Yeah, probably. But her actions completely contradict this. On top of this significant flaw, she rarely has any moments of authority, which is one of the defining character traits of the Doctor. And you haven't got one way of stopping me. So if anybody's gonna shut up, it's you! She was always out of her depth and asking questions rather than controlling situations and taking charge like a 2000 year old Time Lord should. There's a term fans often use called 
Doctor moments, which are standout defining scenes for an incarnation. You get the Pandorica speech for 11, and the Without Witness speech for 12, and those are just two I can think of off the top of my head because there are a lot. Every great decision creates ripples. The heavier the decision, the larger the waves. These kinds of moments show the character traits of certain incarnations, distilling their whole personality and identity down to singular speeches or actions. It's why they're called Doctor moments, because you see them and go, yeah, that's the Doctor. But if I kill, wipe out a whole intelligent life form, then I become like them. The 13th Doctor, however, sorely lacks these kinds of moments, which makes it harder to buy into her as the Doctor. The lack of authority and agency really hampers her, and that's mainly due to the writing not presenting her with these moments to begin with. Flux's scale means the Doctor is on the back foot, and this works well, but the problem is that she has always been on the back foot, so it makes it less effective even if she does have a lot more authority in general. I feel like Flux provided a turning point for the 13th Doctor. She is so much better written, Whitaker finally being given some good material to work with. Look no further than War of the Santarans. The Doctor has a commanding presence in so many scenes, with some great speeches and that brilliant confrontation with Commander Skark, after cleverly hiding her identity as the Doctor to arrange the meeting in the first place, something you could imagine every incarnation doing. She actually starts to feel like the Doctor through and through, which is probably helped by her being away from her companions the whole story, so she doesn't have to act all upbeat and fake anymore. Being paired with Mary Seacole and General Logan allows her to hold the spotlight more, and since she knows more than them, she can exude authority rather than her being just as in the dark as they are. Something as simple as her knowing Sontar isn't real adds so much to her ability to feel like the Doctor, because she's no longer outside looking in. It means she can butt heads with Logan and we know she is completely in the right, so it becomes easier to support her. This aspect of the story gets paid off as Logan commits war crimes to get revenge for his men being killed. The Doctor rightfully calls him out on this, and it's a powerful moment of anger, something the 10th Doctor would do. Sometimes men like you make me wonder why I bother with humanity. A lot of people drew parallels to the end of the Christmas Invasion, and that's a good thing, because it shows how the 13th Doctor is finally starting to feel like a real incarnation. There's another strong moment in Flux that parallels existing Doctor characterization. In the cliffhanger of War of the Centaurans, Swarm prepares to send a Time Storm through Yaz and Vinda to kill them in front of the Doctor. However, she manages to get herself and Dan onto the Murray pedestal so that she can send herself into the storm and try to hold the flow of it together herself. It's a clever solution, and despite a lot of people's misgivings, the slow motion fits perfectly within what we already know about the Doctor. Heaven Sent, one of the most beloved and acclaimed episodes in the show's history, also showed that the Doctor can mentally slow down time in order to solve problems and think of a way out of a life or death situation. It's an established part of this character, who is, you know, an alien time lord from outer space with two hearts and the ability to regenerate their entire body. So the idea of her slowing things down to analyse her situation is nothing new, and it's not even a far-fetched idea to begin with. Alongside this, her being able to move in slow motion like the Flash isn't some sudden new ability either. In literally the second ever episode of the revived era of Doctor Who, the ninth Doctor does the same to walk through a turbine. So 13 doing something similar isn't nearly as ridiculous or law-breaking as a lot of people made it out to be. The Doctor has loads of abilities that come and go whenever a story requires them. Much like her actions in War of the Centaurans, I think that the beginning of Once Upon Time really lends a lot of credibility to the idea that this is the Doctor. She has so much more in common with previous incarnations during Flux than she did in earlier stories which is a definite improvement because it all feels more natural. However, there are still many remaining issues. Her morality is still very questionable. Hatching a plan to allow all the Santarans to be killed by the Flux, which seems unlike the Doctor. She also continues to spout annoying techno babble and overuse her sonic screwdriver. So even though there is a clear improvement, she's still far from where she needs to be. In addition to the Doctor herself improving as a character, her relationship with her companions also feels a lot better. Right from the beginning, the dynamic between the Doctor and Yaz is so much more natural and believable. The companions in series 11 and 12 felt like planks of wood with no real personality or interesting interactions with one another. They were boring, and it didn't make for interesting viewing. I love a wedding, don't we boys? Oh yeah, I can go to a wedding every day if I could. <laughs> Hey, do you need a singer? I know all the classics. However, Flux handles the companions so much more effectively, with the Doctor and Yaz having been a duo off-screen for a while before Dan gets involved. The real off-screen friendship between Jodie and Mandip shines through because their characters actually feel like good friends with a tight bond. A big part of this improved relationship is the fact that there's actually conflict for once. In the previous two series, the companions never really challenged the Doctor. They just always went with what she said and kind of blindly followed her around. 
This isn't the case in Phlox. Yaz gets fed up with the Doctor hiding her search for the Division, leading to arguments between them, because there is clearly a trust imbalance. Yaz trusts the Doctor with her life, but doesn't receive the level of trust or respect she expects back. They argue with each other, and the Doctor has clear moments of snapping at both Yaz and Dan once they try to go against her. It's important for there to be at least some tension between the Doctor and their companion, because it makes things more realistic, since, you know, even the best of friends argue at some point. It's why I have a big problem with Ten and Rose, because they got along too well. There was no drama there compared to the previous series, where they often got into fights. He's here and now, and this is me! Yeah, and I'm here too, because you brought me here, so just tell me! Having the 13th Doctor Doctor finally develop a more nuanced relationship with her companions is similar to her being written more like an actual character. It's the kind of writing we expect from Doctor Who, so it's easier to get invested in her. When it comes to talking about the 13th Doctor and her companions, there's something that always dominates the discussions. Thasmin. Thasmin is the immensely popular ship pairing 13 and Yaz as a romantic couple. Side note, shipping culture is scary, stay far away from it, there are some very concerning pairings. The root issue regarding Thasmin is audience expectation. Barring the 10th Doctor and Donna, there hasn't been a truly two-way platonic relationship between similarly aged main characters. 9 with Rose and 12 with Bill are easily shown as platonic because there's a clear age gap and also Bill's sexual orientation, so it's a lot harder to view these pairings through a romantic lens. However, all the other pairings were written with some form of romance at one point or another, and the pairing of Twelve and Clara was written as non-romantic soulmates, which is still deeper than platonic friends. There's a modern precedent for relationships and romantic interactions in the TARDIS, so it's not surprising that people would see patterns in the Doctor and Yaz's relationship that aren't actually there, like 13 and Yaz don't show anything that would indicate some deep love. Part of that is because Chibnall is terrible at writing characters with emotions, and part of it is him seemingly not knowing how to write two women as platonic friends. When it comes to characters of the same sex, there's a constant media tug of war between, oh they're just roommates, and they're a couple. Sometimes a piece of media makes it so obvious two characters are meant to be attracted to one another, but cowers away and claims they're simply roommates. However, the other way around is just as prevalent, with the audience projecting sexuality onto characters and I feel like that's the case with Thasmin. Rather comically, in The Vanquishers, Chibnall does a Moffat-style self cess tease instead of Thasmin, which is absolutely hilarious to me. The strangest thing is that people who believe in Thasmin were offended and took this as proof of queer baiting, somehow. Hey! What? Not cute! Yes. So are you? I've got such a crush on her. The Doctor claiming to have a crush on her own clone does suggest her being attracted to women, but people seem to think this justified their expectations for Thasmin to happen. This actually perpetuates the same problem with close platonic friendships between characters being viewed as romantic or sexual. It's the exact same thing Arachnids in the UK called attention to. Are you two seeing each other? <laughs> I don't think so. This is just a relatable joke about parents wrongly assuming you're dating a friend, whilst also showing the 13th Doctor's social awkwardness and inability to pick up on cues. But people misunderstood the context and considered it to be a legitimate hint towards a romantic arc. And they never let it go. Yes, the 13th Doctor can be attracted to women. Yes, Yaz can also be attracted to women. But that doesn't mean they have to be attracted to each other. Suggesting they have to be anything other than close friends skirts close to very outdated beliefs and could be harmful in the wider cultural zeitgeist. The audience latched onto this whole Thasmin idea and refused to let go. So it changed how they perceived the relationship. Certain viewers projected their own shipping onto these characters and then complained when it didn't happen, despite there never having been anything concretely suggesting it would. Remember, people also assumed Graham and Yaz were being written into a romance because they had one awkwardly written character bonding scene in Ascension of the Cybermen. The fault does lie on Chibnall's shoulders for weakly characterising all his main characters, but the audience definitely played a significant role in creating their own problems regarding Thasmin. At the end of the day, we don't know what Chibnall's intentions were, but the idea that he was trying to queer bait is a bit ridiculous when you actually go back and look at the supposed evidence without the assumption it's hinting towards Thasmin. I mean, Yaz would actually have to have a fleshed out character for that to work in the first place. 
Despite the improvements of companion dynamics, Yaz yeah, still ends up like a spare part. It's a shame because everyone else is a lot better handled, but Yaz yeah, remains just kind of in the background. There were hints of a character arc in Series 12 as she tried to do her own thing, but it's not until Flux that that actually becomes a proper character journey as she attempts to become more like the Doctor. It's a story we've seen loads of times before with companions like Rose and Clara, illustrating how this lifestyle can influence these characters because they want to impress the Doctor. Yaz's yeah, version of this is a bit of a bumpy ride. Having her walk around with what would the Doctor do written on her hand is kind of cringy and way too obvious, but the sentiment behind it is good. In a way, it almost addresses how she's such a background character, because she is now desperate to step up and actually be noticed. It provides her with more independence and actually gives her a personality for once. At times, her Doctor-like approach works, like when she confidently rescues Dan all by herself, but then there are times where it backfires, like trying to help out the Murray only to get captured by Swarm, so it does a good job showing the highs and lows of attempting to live recklessly like the Doctor. When she, Dan and Jericho get thrown into the past, it's Yaz who takes charge, using the Doctor as inspiration. They have fun archaeology adventures complete with assassins. Yaz in Survivors of the Flux is full of the same kind of quips and even shows some of the Doctor's coldness as she's perfectly fine with dumping a dead body off the boat. You can see her trying to embrace that lifestyle and I think the show finally presents the Shibnall era companions doing some of their own investigating rather than the Doctor doing it all for them. They're so much more useful than the so-called fam were, which is a welcome break. After the departures of companions Graham and Ryan in Revolution of the Daleks, there was an opportunity for the Chimnal era to return to the usual one companion format the modern show had built itself around. However, instead of going this route by having Yaz as the only companion, the show instead elected to introduce Dan Lewis, played by John Bishop. A lot of people didn't like this decision and admittedly, I was one of them. Series 11 and 12 really struggled with a bloated cast. None of them really stood out for their writing, so choosing to maintain a bigger TARDIS team seemed like a horribly misguided move, especially because it would further prevent Yaz from getting any semblance of a character. It also seemed like a desperate stunt cast to recapture the comedy that Bradley Walsh had previously brought to the show, so I was very sceptical about Dan from the very beginning. However, I think it's safe to say most of us were pretty much silenced as soon as the character made his proper debut and started hitting some Torrance with Wox as part of a buddy cop duo with a humanoid dog. Just looking for the period. I know the bar was pretty low, but Dan Lewis is by far the best Jim Lira companion. It's not even close. John Bishop is utterly delightful in this series with lots of good deadpan jokes and moments. How old are you? What's the difference? You're not even dressed up. Obviously Bishop is a comedian more than he is an actor, so the focus is on him bringing humour to the dynamic. But much like Catherine Tate with Donna, Bishop also gives Dan a very human and dramatic side. It's life, isn't it? Nobody gets by with those some bruises. I feel like everyone knows a Dan Lewis at some point in their lives. He's a genuinely lovely and selfless bloke who appreciates everything he has and cares more about others than himself. There's a wonderful moment in the Halloween apocalypse where he sees the beauty of the universe whilst the Doctor and Yaz complain about there being nothing out there. He's just really well written and acted, a regular guy thrust into this chaos but still finding time to crack witty northern remarks that are actually funny because they come from two scousers so they feel natural. Now obviously Dan loses points for being a filthy Liverpool supporter, but I think he's the perfect addition to the cast, he's simply amazing. Dan is an accidental companion. At first, he's not really a voluntary traveller in the TARDIS because he's simply being rescued by the Doctor and kind of thrown into this adventure. I think this makes him a very good audience surrogate. He's so normal and natural having lived all his life in Liverpool without really seeing what's beyond. This is a way to punctuate all the weird happenings and personify all the questions the audience are asking throughout the series. He's simple, real and down to earth fit in the show perfectly with his vulnerability and sense of right and wrong. We often see him taking matters into his own hands, like when he single-handedly infiltrates a Sontaran shipyard despite seeing the executioner face if he gets caught. He has the bravery and confidence you expect from a Doctor Who companion, so it's incredibly easy to get invested with him from an early point. This kind of background helps to give him a personality and actual goals rather than just kind of existing like the previous Chibnall era companions did. I feel like the characterisation of Dan is comparable to Davis era companions especially since he has pre-existing relationships within the present day. He has parents and a love interest, which is honestly nice to see after the Moffin and Chibnall eras completely dropped the ball when it came to things like families and lovers. Oh sorry, did I say that Dan's personal relationships were good? Well you got fooled just like all the viewers were. After that strong initial impression, his 
parents never show up again, and Diane ends up little more than a plot device for Vinda to rescue, since she's trapped inside Passenger, an entity capable of holding hostages. They also really like Airsoft. Whilst this creates personal stakes for Dan, giving him something to fight for, it just never really comes up and he doesn't even mention it at all in episode 4 and 5. You'd think a character would be more concerned about their love interest being taken hostage by the main antagonists, but he basically forgets. Even his species bonded relationship with Carvanista basically gets thrown out of the window. Initially it sets up this reluctant bromance between the two, but after War of the Centaurans they don't really interact again until the finale, making you wonder what the point of it was for Dan's character or personality. Flux essentially front-loaded Dan's character development. It makes me wonder if he's presented as too perfect, he isn't given any flaws. The fact he's such a lovable and perfect guy is both the best and worst thing about him. On one hand it makes him very relatable and appealing, but on the other, he doesn't have a character arc and hasn't got anything to learn. On the surface he is a joy to watch and a breath of fresh air, with some good companion characteristics and memorable moments, but underneath there are still the same tired problems with Chimel companions and it's a huge shame. They don't get enough focus or development and feel like accessories, because there are too many cooks in the kitchen. One of Chris Chibnall's biggest issues as a writer is introducing too many characters, and the companions of his Doctor Who era really suffer from this. I've always maintained that while the companions should have all been introduced in The Woman Who Fell to Earth, they should have also all joined the Doctor at different points. Ryan would be the first companion, treating him as the focus of Series 11, with Graham joining an arachnids in the UK as a way to escape the grief of Grace's death. Then Yaz joins at the beginning of Series 12 after being a recurring present day character throughout Series 11, similar to Rory. This would have handled the workload a lot more effectively and given each of them time to focus and explore their relationships, but instead they're all introduced at once and none of them stand out as a result. You even get two more prominent characters in the Ghost Monument, then there's Rosa, focusing entirely on the historical figure Rosa Parks, after that it's Arachnids in the UK, which tries to introduce Yaz's family and Mr. Not Trump Jack Robertson, so the companions never really have any time to be written because there's always a side character. This kind of chaotic mess continues throughout series 11 and 12, constantly adding new characters without developing the actual companions or even writing them as people. They always came across as means to an end, characters who only exist to progress the plot or ask questions on the audience's behalf. They had no character arcs, so everything felt flat. So by condensing a series down to six connected episodes with a specific cast, you'd think that Chimnall would finally be able to improve this aspect of his writing, wouldn't you? Well as some weird goofy Canadians once said, expect nothing, receive less. Unsurprisingly, Flux is another disaster when it comes to Chimnall's character management. Sure, it gives the companions plenty to do without the Doctor, but that's kind of the problem. They're constantly split off and don't even know anything about the Ravagers or the Division. Pretty much all they know is that the Flux was a vague thing that happened. They have no character development, the plot just experiences around them. Their absence from the Doctor and survivors of the Flux would be effective to hammer home the consequences of Yaz and Dan being sent back into the past by the Weeping Angels, but then them being absent from the Doctor happens constantly, which actually devalues such a scenario. In fact, Dan only has a single full scene alone with the Doctor. His entrance into the TARDIS? Yaz is there. Their conversation in the Centauran ship? Mary Seacole was chilling there. Dan finally joining the TARDIS voluntarily? Carvanista is in that scene. The Doctor and Dan have an anti-relationship because they barely even interact, which is just downright bizarre, even by Chimnall standards. If anything, Dan is Yaz's companion. He spent spends way more time with her, and it's a friendship you could get behind because their interactions are nice, but the fact that an official Doctor Who companion is barely even a companion is a damning indication of the bloated cast. Much like the previous two series, Flux has an obsession with introducing new protagonists. Dan, Carvanista, Diane, Claire, Vinda, Belle, Jericho, Williamson. These are all new characters who show up in multiple episodes, and that's on top of all the one-off characters. It's painfully excessive, and and they get lost in the crowd. Having so many main characters works in shows like Broadchurch because they're much longer, grounded narratives, so they can give these people the right amount of time and development. Flux has all these characters, but there isn't enough time, so you only really feel attached to one or two of them. Despite cutting the companion count from 3 to 2, Chimnall was clearly still desperate to maintain a big TARDIS team, and he took advantage of the narrative drama format to introduce recurring side characters. The most prominent of these is Commander Vinder, played by the wonderful Jacob Anderson, or as some people might know him, Riley Ritchie. 
Now, I'm definitely biased because I'm a big fan of Jacob and his music, but Vinder is a really delightful part of Flux. Right from the start of marketing, the cards were stacked against Vinder. Anderson's casting announcement was hyped up as a super secret special guest, which naturally led fans to expect someone like Alex Kingston, John Barrowman, or even David Tennant, because Doctor Who fans love to set themselves up for disappointment. A lot of people actually complained and played down Anderson's casting, claiming Chimnall was just trying to use Game of Thrones for clout, or the ridiculous theory that Vinder was some last minute replacement for Captain Jack after the BBC cut ties with John Barrowman in May 2021, you know, after Flux had pretty much already finished filming. Much like Dan, Vinda had a mountain to climb, but I think he managed to silence his critics in the same fashion. His introduction is wonderful, his love for the beauty of the universe contrasted by his hatred of the people who sent him to this observation satellite. He has a very interesting and protagonist-like backstory. He was a maverick pilot and risk taker in a huge empire and his reward is being assigned as muscle for the Grand Serpent himself in an important meeting. It gives you the sense of how much potential his career had. However, when he reports the Grand Serpent's order for the execution of political enemies, Enemies, Vinder's whole life and career is crushed. This is fascinatingly dark commentary on the abuse of power and things like the Me Too movement, where crimes are covered up to silence the victim and protect the accused. Indeed, Vinder is just thrown into the far reaches of space without any contact with the outside universe or his family. This makes him very sympathetic and heroic because he still filed the report even though he knew what would happen to him. But that threat didn't stop him from doing the right thing. It's easy to understand why he and the Doctor would get along, especially because they've both experienced unfair exiles for just being a good person. Person. Vinder's forced exile takes him half the universe away from his partner Belle and that as yet unborn child. Throughout the series, she makes her way through the destruction to reunite with him, which opens up the universe a lot. But to be honest, Belle is a side effect of Flux's weird character juggling. She just shows up randomly when the narrative decides to suddenly focus on her, and they always shoehorn in narration as she monologues about how determined she is to find Vinder again. Modern Doctor Who has always been hyper-focused on the power of love, so it is is cute that she embarks on this huge odyssey with near impossible chances of success, but there's nothing much to it. It's just there. In principle it's great, giving Vinder his own existing relationships and goals to help flesh him out. But there's simply an aggressive blandness to Bell's scenes. That's nothing to do with the acting, the writing is just so lifeless. It feels more like a means to an end than a well thought out side story. Their big reunion is a sweet moment, but it doesn't serve the story at all. There were a lot of theories about Vinder and Bell being the Doctor's real parents, which I'm incredibly glad didn't become reality. But for a subplot that dominated so much of the series, you would expect it to have more narrative significance, which makes it really strange and anticlimactic. I do like them joining up with Car Minister at the end though, deciding to roll around the universe in the Lapari ship taking on jobs. You know what, I already like it a lot more than the Paternoster gang. So you know what that means, you better get Nick Briggs on the line. Part 7, A Universe of Monsters it's pretty hard to dispute that the first Russell T Davis era of Doctor Who was the most successful period of the modern show. I think one of the biggest contributors of this was the idea of a shared universe. Not only were there two fully fledged spin offs, but the iconic aliens of the era had defined roles. The Jadoon were the space police, the Ood were the slaves, the Daleks had a running storyline for three series. It felt like a consistent universe with recurring monsters and creatures, and also things like Unit and Torchwood, so everything felt tighter. This obviously started fading away under Moffat and was completely abolished with Chibnall, who even got rid of Unit for a bit. After series 11 and 12 kind of floundered about with the monsters, Flux finally uses them to achieve a similar shared universe effect. We introduced the idea that in the aftermath of the Flux event, the Daleks, Cybermen and Centaurans all sought to claim what's left of the universe, each forming an empire. It's a very natural consequence because these are the three main monsters and they all have the tendency to invade as many planets as possible, even if they don't understand the Flux. Some people had issues with the minor roles of the Daleks and Cybermen, but it's perfect to make such a universe breathe and feel expansive, introducing power vacuums. It's enough to know that they're there, you don't need to focus on them. It's exactly what you need with a narrative drama version of Doctor Who, taking full advantage of the back catalogue of monsters. It's the same with the return of Kate Stewart and Unit, reminding you of the structure and makeup of the Earth and the wider universe. Because you're shown how all these outside influences can fit together and become relevant. You get these cameos to strengthen the world building, but then there are also what I like to call spotlight monsters that were more prominent throughout the series. 
The first of these spotlight monsters are the Centaurans, who capitalise on the flux by invading Earth with the aim to conquer the planet throughout history, quite literally becoming Time Warriors. This makes for a brilliant narrative spanning human history, since they invade the Crimean War, replacing Russia with Sontar like they're playing a Paradox Grand Strategy game. The Crimean War is the perfect kind of setting for the Centaurans, because it's a blend of old fashioned and contemporary styles of warfare, allowing us to see the Centaurans at their best. It's important to remember the last Cirrus Centauran appeared all the way back in 2010, with the comedic Strax becoming how pretty much everyone saw the monsters. Okay, that last part? and we will not melt him with acid. Obviously it's hard to take walking potato warrior seriously to begin with, but Strax was a new level of goofiness, completely stripping away any kind of seriousness from the villains. Sir, emergency! I think I've been run over by a cab! War of the Centaurans had to find a way to make them a serious threat again, like they were in Series 4 and Classic Who, and it did this really well with scenes like them easily massacring the British army without taking a single casualty. It's one of the only times we've seen a proper Centauran battle playing out, so it was a brilliant show of strength. Their very intimidating and overwhelming force threatening two different time periods as they also convert Liverpool into shipyards, executing anyone who defies them. They're characterised exactly how Centaurans should be, with their loss for war and refusal to receive medical assistance because dying is more honourable. So I definitely think Flux was a return to form for such an iconic, yet consistently mishandled Doctor Who monster. However, as always, the Centaurans aren't perfect. Their design looks quite cheap and plasticky. The designers wanted to go back to the classic Who roots, but it just doesn't look good. It's better in motion, but in images they look really goofy. The worst part about them though comes from two specific scenes in War of the Centaurans. Firstly there's the moment as Dan appears back in Liverpool, only to be chased by a squad of Centaurans who have a serious case of Stormtrooper aim. This became a huge drama on Twitter as people went back and forth about it, but the bottom line is that yes, this is a bit ridiculous. You have a species literally bred for war, but they can't seem to kill or even catch a random unarmed middle aged scouser running in a straight line. It definitely takes a lot of suspension of disbelief, but I can personally overlook this. I mean, first of all, it's not like they're going to kill a main character so randomly, that's just not really how these things work. Secondly, Centaurans like to play with their food, so I wouldn't put it past them to intentionally miss in order to make things more fun. And in terms of only two following Dan down the alleyway, listen to this. They're literally moving to cut him off, and you can see them doing that in the background. That also makes it understandable how Dan's parents can sneak in, so most of the scene does make sense. And also lastly, let me just add, this is the exact same alien race who infamously tripped over a deck chair in a legitimate episode. So I have no issues with just acknowledging that this scene with Dan is a bit goofy without it actually ruining my enjoyment. What I struggle a bit more to defend though is how the Centaurans are beaten in Crimea. It's yet another case of Shivnal failing to create a satisfying payoff to a great setup. This whole time they've been outmaneuvering their opponents, using a base close by so that they can confuse the British forces trying to locate them. On the open battlefield they're insurmountable, so the Doctor has to use her own tactics to bring them down. How does she do this? All the Centaurans go back into their ships for a 7.5 minute nap at the exact same time, so she just unplugs their resource supply to force them off the planet. First of all, there was a Centauran patient in the British Hotel functioning just fine without this resource supply, and even worse than that is the horrible logic of all the monsters going inside at the exact same time. Did they never think of developing shifts? It's a very hard to believe solution, but I personally like to think that the Centaurans were so confident in victory that they'd overlooked the slim chances of the British Army finding a way to stop them. In a way, it's just a scaled up version of the conclusion to the Centauran experiment, where Harry sabotaged Star's ability to recharge his energy, therefore killing him. It actually makes sense that their downfall would come from a lack of common sense, because they have perpetual tunnel vision and can only comprehend war and battle. They had just defeated the only significant threat nearby, and they, like all other Doctor monsters, underestimate the Doctor. So why would they expect someone to pick up and exploit that brief window of weakness? Besides, not all Centauran commanders would be as big brain as others, so perhaps Skark was just a bad leader. I mean, it's like being the manager of one of the biggest football clubs in the world and not knowing basic basic football tactics. That would be impossible, right? 
The other main returning monsters of the series are the Weeping Angels, who hadn't been the focus of an episode since 2012's disastrous mess, The Angels Take Manhattan. Much like the Santarans, Flux had to reignite interest in a villain that had been mishandled, even though they remained iconic. Ever since Blink, the Weeping Angels have been badly written with lots of unnecessary lore and they lost their fear factor. Flesh and Stone showed them moving, before Angels Take Manhattan had the gall to turn the Statue of Liberty into a Weeping Angel, despite that making no logical sense. The villains were in a really rough spot, but Flux managed to handle them well while still adding new aspects to such a tired monster. They're reintroduced in the Halloween Apocalypse by teasing Claire's involvement in the series. The scene itself is awkwardly integrated and superfluous, but the use of the Weeping Angel itself is good. Everyone already knows how they work, so it creates a tense situation as Claire struggles with her keys and allows the angel to get closer and closer before catching her. It's a straightforward, eerie scene taking them back to their basics as silent assassins. It's not until once upon time that their other abilities are then teased. An angel stalks Yaz through her timeline leading to it stealing the TARDIS which was the main threat of Blink. Not only does this lay the groundwork for their presence in the following episode, but it re-establishes the image of an angel law, which is a central part of Village of the Angels. So Flux uses its split narrative storytelling to firmly reintroduce the angels in a smooth and fitting way by using brief scenes here and there to rebuild them ahead of their proper appearance. Expectations were high after Maxine Alderton had previously written the popular gothic horror episode The Haunting of Villa Diodati, which helped to recapture the threat of the Cybermen. However, due to the weight of the wider narrative Village of the Angels was a part of, she wasn't quite able to succeed in the same kind of resurrection of a weaker villain. The titular angels in Village of the Angels are a mixed bag because they continue to carry that baggage from the Moffat era. It was always stupid that the angels could talk because it takes away from their mystique. Blink managed to perfectly deliver their motivations through their actions and the Doctor's explanation of what they are and how they work. They were completely silent and that made them terrifying. But then Series 5 came along and made them talk directly to the Doctor to explain everything. Even in that though, it was at least a communication device. In Village of the Angels, however, they can just talk to anyone in any way and it further takes away from that mystique. It works wonders for moments like the confrontation inside Claire's mind, since it's a surreal dreamscape. But when it happens in the real world, it just feels cheap. It's symbolic of the feature creep the angels keep going through. Each appearance adds another big power or ability, so it starts to add up and Village really feels the burden of this. The episode ranges from desperate callbacks to previous episodes to the return of huge fallacies like them being in crowds which should be freezing them forever. The Weeping Angels are a rule-based monster, so them constantly being given new abilities and powers makes it almost impossible for them to actually make sense. It's indicative of a wider issue of such a villain, an example of how more lore becomes more restrictive. Village of the Angels takes the existing powers of the Weeping Angels to their logical extremes. Angels can appear from mental images or drawings, they can talk with people's own voices, and they can sneak inside of your head. It's the problem that stems from needing to constantly up the ante, but the angels in this episode being overpowered is actually a good thing. It makes them an unstoppable force of nature, like a monster in a nightmare that constantly bats away everything you throw at it. This reminds you as the viewer of the simple, defining trait of the angels. They're horrifying. They may not be scary here, but they're incredibly threatening. Their ability to appear from even rough sketches or the reflection of flames restores their threat level and makes them more unpredictable. The characters in the episode aren't safe and there's no guarantee they'll survive their encounters with the angels, which is helped by Yaz, Dan and Jericho remaining trapped in the past. The weeping angels in this episode are perfectly unbeatable because that's the point. This isn't an episode where the Doctor wins and the angels are the perfect monster to represent that. They're naturally difficult to defeat to begin with, which makes it even more powerful as they go the extra step and straight up turn the Doctor into an angel themselves, ripping her very identity from her. It represents how powerful these Division Angels are. They can easily sweep aside the companions and toy with the Doctor, leading her on this wild goose chase just to trap her at the end, revealing that she had no power this entire time. It makes them incredibly intimidating and uses their overpowered nature as a strength because it causes the stakes to skyrocket, because it just becomes about survival. Indeed, much like Face the Raven, the Doctor gets purposefully manipulated and led to a trap because it's a scenario she can't resist. The reason Claire was stalked by a weeping angel in the Halloween Apocalypse is because a rogue Division Angel took shelter in her mind, so she was sent back to 1967 so the angel could be extracted due to its expansive and convenient knowledge of the Division. This is the perfect trap for the Doctor, because it gives her someone to save. 
Claire is a hostage and could get killed by her angel at any point, so the Doctor is forced to help them both at the same time. Without her knowing it, the warring angels put the Doctor in a lose-lose situation, especially because the rogue angel uses her as a bargain. After all, who is the more lucrative target? Some random weeping angel? Or the Doctor, the oldest Time Lord of them all? And one of the biggest assets of the Division. It's honestly a fantastic reveal. The penny drop is perfect, filling you with dread as you see the trap finally sprung. The Doctor thought she was in control, but she was being played by the Division yet again, representing the huge gulf in power between the two entities. She gets sealed in time as a Weeping Angel to be transported to the Division, which is a brilliant climax. The Weeping Angels completely win, which helps to re-legitimise them as a threat because they finally have a proper victory over the Doctor herself after so many episodes where they were beaten. It's just a shame that the transformation looks like a Power Rangers morph. Lastly, one big complaint people had about the Angels in Flux is that they don't send people back in time twice. In Angels Hate Manhattan, Rory was sent back into the past twice and didn't disintegrate like he'd been Thanos snapped. On the surface, it makes sense why this would be an issue, since it directly contradicts previously established lore about the Angels. But these are actually two very different situations. First of all, the Angels in Village are Division operatives, so you can easily assume they operate differently to regular Angels. Secondly, the couple die because they're in a place frozen and taken out of time. There's nowhere else for them to go. You can travel from 1967 to 1901, but no further back than that. Therefore, your body would just disintegrate. There are plenty of easy and logical explanations. So much like the Suntaran Stormtrooper aim stuff, it's something really minor people made a huge deal out of for no reason other than nitpicking the series and treating small continuity errors like big gotcha criticisms. If anything, the main issue with the Weeping Angels in Flux is that they're purely a plot device to get the Doctor to the Division. Once they've served their purpose as glorified postmen, they disappear completely and don't play any role in the finale. The Suntarans are a major part of the serial, one of the three main factions, but the Weeping Angels feel so isolated and inconsequential. They're pretty much the only part of the series that doesn't get crammed into the finale. Part 8 The Vanquishers as most people unfortunately predicted, Flux fails to stick the landing. For me, the cracks really started to show in episode 5, Survivors of the Flux, where we don't really meet any Survivors of the Flux. Instead, there's an entire unit storyline introduced. Yeah, even in the penultimate episode, Chibnall still adds more stuff. Remember that random guy from Vinder's backstory who was only there to show how Vinder was failed by the system? Yeah, well it turns out he's actually a big villain now, manipulating all of Unit's history to gain power and sabotage the Earth from within. I appreciate that Unit being defunded now has a proper storyline reason, rather than just being a terrible Brexit joke. And the Grand Serpent is very sinister in this political thriller landscape, but was it really necessary? The series was already stuffed full of characters and villains, so why bring the Grand Serpent into it as a sudden big bad out of nowhere. It's even worse when you get to the finale and he doesn't really do anything. He just skulks around shouting about Kate Stewart all the time. It's like he's a villain from a completely unrelated episode. There's no reason for him to be here. It's cool to see Vinder get revenge by exiling him in return for everything he did, but it wasn't a necessary plot point. Nothing changes if you remove it. The Doctor even acts like he's an afterthought. One thing left undone. The Grand Serpent goes from being a decent standalone backstory for Vinder to being a shoehorned in villain in the final two episodes. If you cut that whole side plot, Chapter 5 has so much more room to breathe and would have a much easier job connecting plot strands like Vinder and Diane, or the Doctor and the Division. The episode is designed to place all the characters and entities where they need to be in the finale, so shoehorning in a random unit Grand Serpent plot feels really weird and unproductive. Not including it would mean Survivors of the Flux could spend much more time with their stranded companions and everyone's favourite character, Tunnel Man. One of the weirdest parts of Flux is the real historical figure, Joseph Williamson, or as we like to call him, Tunnel Man. By the way, this guy was an absolute mad lad. Once he invited all his friends over for dinner, gave them porridge and hard biscuits to weed out the leeches, and then gave his real friends a huge feast. 
Oh, and he went hunting right after his wedding. What a chad. However, in Flux, he doesn't do anything like either of those. Instead, he just shows up in random episodes without any explanation. No, I'm not even joking. He literally just walks into scenes unprompted like he's not sure what set he's meant to be on. Williamson is so weirdly integrated, and this led to the moniker Tunnel Man, because all we knew about his character is that he's obsessed with tunnels, for some reason. We have to deal with three episodes of him cropping up randomly without explanation until it's all finally cleared up in survival of the Flux. It turns out that this whole time his tunnel project has been hiding literal doorways to other times and places like he's Xavier Renegade Angel. What's the logic behind all this? There isn't any, it's just a thing that exists for the companions to get back to modern day. Again, I'm not joking. He shows up all through the series, setting up this huge mystery or plot point, but then they just walk through a door and arrive back in modern day. It's so weird. Like, Chimnall was trying to find a workaround for his own plot element of Dan and Yaz being trapped in the past, so he created a whole tunnel subplot throughout the whole series for that sole reason. Williamson even gets kind of pushed out of the story without actually doing anything, proving how pointless the narrative he was after all. Your work is done. Okay, bye, I guess. I have to go now. My planet needs me. The companions return to find yet another Centauran invasion of Earth, since the monsters exacted revenge by storming the Lupari ships and executing all the pilots. Since Doctor is a family show, we don't get to see this genocide happen, because seeing 7 billion dogs get executed would be a bit of a bummer, but even though this takes place off screen and Carvinista doesn't really get to properly react to it, it does speak to the power of the Centaurans. Wiping out an entire species is a minor part of their plan, it's nothing to them because it's like stepping on a bunch of ants. It's a strong statement, showcasing the might of the Centaurans in an emphatic way. What we did need to see more of though was the actual invasion of Earth. The Centaurans retaking the planet is a fantastic hook for the finale because it directly threatens our home, but none of this feels grounded. There's a little bit of a time jump so we don't actually see the conquering of the planet or how everyday people are affected. Instead, we just get random shots of the Centaurans patrolling the streets and then eating chocolate like me lumbering into the kitchen at 1am to scoff down an entire bar of Miss Molly's white chocolate. Don't get me wrong, the big bad Santarans raiding a corner shop is the exact kind of goofy Doctor Who schlocky fun we all love, but it's a waste of a scene that could have been better used to show the realities of the occupation like we saw in War of the Santarans. The Davis era finale did this kind of stuff perfectly. In series 2, you have families sheltering from the invading Cybermen and the army battling them in the streets showing us the view from the surface. It's the same in the Stolen Earth, there's panic and rioting, we see unit being over Run. There are all kinds of scenes building up a realistic sense of danger, putting names and faces to the people under threat. But in The Vanquishers, the Sontarans conquer the entire planet and we don't get to see what the regular people of Earth actually think about that. There's no cutaway to the families of the companions to show how they're affected. Not having crowd reactions lessens the stakes because it makes Earth nothing more than a setting, rather than a living, breathing planet full of people who could be killed by these villains. However, the Centauran plan is actually really smart. Allying with the Grand Serpent allows them to take over the Lupari ships without Earth retaliating. Since the Lupari ships can shield from the Flux, that gives them a level of power the Daleks and Cybermen don't have. In a universe where the Flux is unstoppable, the most valuable resource is something to hold it back, and the Centaurans own that. This therefore gives them the ability to lure in the other two main races under the false pretense of protection from the Flux. Now, obviously this alliance would probably fall through pretty quickly because the three races always betray their allies, but the Daleks and the Cybermen have no other choice but to accept the peace deal. It's a really clever strategy and it makes the Centaurans a smart climactic villain as they then move the Lupara ships to doom their supposed allies to the Flux, removing their competition so that they can take whatever's left of the universe for themselves. It's honestly really cool to see the Centaurans destroy the Daleks and Cybermen. It elevates them as a threat. These days it's pretty easy to forget that the Centaurans managed to invade Gallifrey in the show decades before the Daleks or the Cybermen ever did, so they are a genuine threat which episodes like this manage to show really well. Similarly, the Daleks and Cybermen have an eternal high standing within the Doctor universe. They will always be popular and big villains, so having them completely wiped out by the Centaurans does so much in terms of elevating the Centaurans to a higher tier of villain. They may still be a bit overly goofy with their chocolate obsession, but how many other beings in the Doctor universe can claim to have outsmarted both the Daleks and the Cybermen, let alone with the same single tactical move.
I think it's safe to say The Vanquishers is the busiest series finale in Doctor Who history. There is so much going on, and I think this is shown by the sheer amount of characters there are. Just look at that cast list. Ooh, that hurts. This episode is kind of Journey's End without the heart. It's sad because it actually handles the companions much better than that episode. In Journey's End, the extensive companion cast basically just make empty threats to Davros and then stand around in a room for the rest of the plot. It's great to see this big ambitious team up, but they don't actually contribute anything. The Vanquishers, however, actually gives the characters stuff to do. Jericho and Claire exploit the Centauran Psychic Command to track down where the monsters will be converging, Carl and Ister remotely pilots the Lupari ships to trick the Centaurans, Bell and Vinda destroy the Centauran comm relays, Diane comes up with a passenger solution, Dan rescues Carl and Ister, and even Bell's unborn child has a role, because the whole Tamagotchi interface thing intercepted the Centauran message to the Cybermen and the Daleks, cluing the Doctor in on their scheme. It's all a good, productive way to unite the major characters. It's really just Yaz and Kate that have nothing to do, which when you really think about it, is quite funny, considering they're the two characters who have existed the longest. Kate is basically just there for recognisability, since she's an old character returning. It is nice to see her, but she disappears from half the story, like she exists in a vacuum. She doesn't even get to go in the TARDIS. It's why it's such a risk to have a big cast like this, because people will inevitably fall by the wayside. There's only really one significant character moment in this episode, and that's Jericho's death. He and Claire have teleportation rings, allowing them to return to the TARDIS, but Jericho fumbles with his, and it gets blown up during a firefight, so he has no escape from the flock. As I mentioned, earlier, Jericho was one of the most popular characters of the series, meaning his death actually works on an emotional level, because the audience have that connection to him. He stands firm and still refuses to surrender, along with his defiance of the Santarans echoing that of Harriet Jones in the face of the Daleks. We know who you are! Oh, you know nothing of any human. Nameless human. I, sir, am Professor Eustatius Jericho. Chimnall has always had an issue with characters you don't care about sacrificing themselves, like Koshamus, who the Doctor just allowed to trigger the death particle. However, Jericho cannot be saved and has a simple death, so it all feels sadder. It's just a shame that none of his friends even react to it. Get this. Yas reacted more to the death of the random old couple in Village of the Angels, but a man she spent three years travelling the world with? No, that just deserves a mildly concerned stare into the middle distance. Great job, Yas. Since The Vanquishers is so busy, it actually splits the Doctor into three different versions so she can have a presence in all three major narratives. It's important to remember how little she did in The Time of Children. She was completely non-existent in the actual storyline and just stood in a room for the whole episode. It's one of the many reasons why that finale is so bad, because it completely eliminates the main character from the actual story, leaving it to the companions and even the master to do literally everything regarding the Cybermen. Since Chim still wanted to persist with the idea of a monologuing confrontation for the entire episode, he actually, probably accidentally, created a brilliant workaround. Whilst trying to escape the Division ship, Swarm attempts to transport the Doctor away, which in turn causes her to be split across three different locations all at once. Obviously there remains a similarity to Journey's End having two versions of the Tenth Doctor, but this one is a lot more interesting and helps keep the flow of the story a lot smoother than the previous two finales. The Doctor, aka the main character, constantly drives the narrative forward, but even though I like this part of the narrative, Chibnall missed such an easy opportunity. Just have the Fugitive Doctor show up. She was literally in an earlier episode, so you can have her appear again because of all the timeline shenanigans. This gives the audience more time with this secretive incarnation, with her and the bonus 13 working together, whilst the main 13 is dealing with Swarm and Azure. It's such a simple fix that would actually capitalise on a plot point from earlier in the series, which is why it baffles me so much that Chimnall seemed to completely forget about it. Like, she's right there! Chibnall, you make me angry! Her presence would even make the genocide of the Centaurans a bit easier to hand wave away, since Fugitive of the Jadoon established her as more ruthless and morally grey, so her wiping out all the Centaurans with the Flux would make so much more sense. Out of all the mispotential in the Chibnall era, this already stands out to me as the most glaring, since the episode actively ignores an important part of the series which would actually solve a major pacing and structural problem. A lot of stuff happens in The Vanquishers and it's hard to keep up, especially because people don't stop spouting technobabble at a million miles an hour. Metabolic processing, lesser gravity, restorative gas composition, that would provoke a predilection. Sorry, I forgot to mention. I'm being trisected across disparate dimensions. I have a synaptic collider implanted in my brain. Binary demi species with interbody bioprojection. Retro temporal manifestations. Yep, 
Please stop talking. It never slows down, so you have to pay complete attention without a single distraction, otherwise you get lost in the chaos of it all. I already mentioned the conclusion of the Ravager storyline back in that section, but the end of the Flux threat was also received very poorly. After rescuing Diane, reuniting Bell and Vinda, and defeating the Centaurans, the Doctor stops the Flux by having the passenger form absorb it all. I actually thought this was quite a smart resolution. People kept bringing up Chekhov's loaded gun as a criticism of the finale, which is a theory that states if you show a gun in the first act, you have to fire it by the end. And now it's been seen, I will have to shoot someone before the end of the play. <laughs> Funnily enough, the passenger form ending was actually an example of this concept. We were introduced to passenger all the way back in War of the Centaurans, with once upon time explaining how they can hold thousands of life forms inside, something shown in Village of the Angels and Survivors of the Flux. Hell, once upon time even showed the passenger's abilities being used against the Ravagers at Atropos. So I think it was a good solution to the whole Flux problem, because it uses this big plot element that had been going on in the background. Round. To be honest, the main issue is that there were other solutions set up and ignored. Survivors of the Flux changed the titular Flux from destroying everything to compressing the universe, with the Doctor making a point about how it could be uncompressed. So you'd think that would be the solution, right? No, it never actually comes up again. It's so strange, especially because the universe doesn't get fixed. Or does it? No, yes, no, I, I don't know, nobody actually knows. Earlier I praised the permanent destruction caused by the Flux, but rather ironically, this permanence is a big problem at the very end. Series 13 established that almost the entire universe was wiped out by the Flux event, but it never explicitly undoes this. I would like this if it felt intentional. It always feels cheap when a big story is undone, like Last of the Time Laws, which reverses everything so nothing actually happened. It feels like a frustrating cop out when this happens, but rather than feeling like Chimnall intentionally subverted this trope, it instead comes across like he completely forgot all the destruction he went to great lengths to show. Initially, The Vanquishers feels like a satisfying end wrapping up all these plot threads, even getting Claire back to 2021, which I think everyone forgot about. But then when you start to think about it, it becomes more and more messy and you end up realising how many questions remain unanswered by the end. Where did the Ravagers come from? What was in that mysterious house? What happened to the Fugitive Doctor? Who actually was the Grand Serpent? Where is the rest of the universe now? What happened to the Time Entity? Why is the TARDIS still messed up? So what's the deal with the Division now? Why has life on Earth gone completely back to normal despite a widespread Sontaran invasion? Most importantly, what happened to that Ood? Is he safe? Is he alive? Is he still stuck in a ship between universes? Someone go rescue him then! But in all seriousness, there is still so much left unsaid by the end of The Vanquishers, so it goes from satisfying to merely satisfactory at best? It's the same kind of mess the Smith era finales become when you try to work out what actually happened. It feels fun to watch in the moment, but then you have to do mental gymnastics to get onto the same wavelength as the writer. If Chimnall hadn't stuffed the series full of so much stuff, the finale and series as a whole would be a lot less crowded and overflowing. Flux's constant adding of new characters and storylines could have been easily mitigated if they had just been spread out over the course of the whole Chibnall era. So you know what, let's get into script doctor mode and use the power of hindsight to reformat his first two series. So, series 11 is irrelevant to Flux. I think that's quite obvious by now, but here's what you do instead. Make series 11 a self-contained serial of the Doctor trying to find the TARDIS again. You can keep the majority of the episodes, just find creative ways to get them to each new location, like season 12 did back in the 70s. Okay, so you have that. What about a villain? You can even still keep Zim Shah, but instead of fighting for the honour of some warrior race or whatever the hell he was doing, you make him an agent of the Grand Serpent. Yes, this character should have been introduced that early. He has an empire, so he can replace Illin in the Ghost Monument, and you can also have his twisting of unit back on Earth happening in the background, alongside him probably getting along quite well with Jack Robertson. The Grand Serpent, Zimshar, and Krasko are the main villains of the series, as they try to trap or kill the Doctor and her companions for reasons we don't entirely know yet. In the finale, Zimshar and Krasko are dealt with, but the Grand Serpent escapes, although not before Kate Stewart is forced out of unit. This would all make his reappearance in Flux much more impactful, along with giving us that link to Vinda's backstory when we see him in the past. We would already know about the Grand Serpent and all his machinations, so Series 13 wouldn't have to dedicate a lot of time to it. Instead, his part of the Centauran invasion would be a big reveal, playing off your knowledge of the earlier series. 
So, after Series 11 deals with the Grand Serpent and his part of the universe, you get to Series 12, which can actually largely stay the same, since it's already heavily linked to Series 13. Even so, you condense it down, focusing on the destruction of Gallifrey, the Fugitive Doctor and the Timeless Child. All these aspects play a role in every episode, along with the Master being the main villain, either always directly facing off against the Doctor, or sometimes hatching evil schemes in the background. Focusing on all these lore-based aspects in Series 12 allows you to introduce the Division earlier, clearing up some of the baggage we ended up with in Flux. If you shift all these villains and storylines into the first two series, Series 13 doesn't need to constantly introduce new things and characters in every episode. Instead, the serial would feel like a logical and satisfying payoff to what had been building for two series. The Flux itself would have been hinted at from the very beginning, teasing this impending cataclysm the Doctor doesn't know about and we'd be able to see the aftermath of the event on planets we had been to in Series 11 and 12. The Division would have been set up and explored more in Series 12, so Flux would be able to focus more on the Ravagers and their involvement in everything. The main issue of Flux is that it has to make up for lost time, and ends up frantic and crammed as a result. If Chibnall had instead structured his era with three tightly crafted narrative drama series, accompanied with standalone special his era might have been a lot better received and held in a much higher regard, possibly even up there of his two predecessors. The 13th Doctor's era would feel like a smooth and calculated journey culminating in a sprawling space epic ending the entire universe. But instead, Flux kind of comes out of nowhere and chaotically flails around because it still needed to mop up all the Division and Timeless Child stuff from Series 12. Part 9. Forgetting an Arc in Fugitive of the Jadoon and the Timeless Children, it was revealed that the Doctor was once part of a secretive Time Lord organisation called The Division, whose job is to interfere with time and space despite the Time Lord non-interference policy. Because despite the Doctor being put on trial twice for that, no one actually cares. The Division are also totally not the legally distinct version of the Celestial Intervention Agency, because they're not just Time Lords. It's definitely a different thing guys, we swear. In Fugitive of the Jadoon, we were introduced to the Fugitive Doctor Doctor, along with the characters Gat and Lee, who were both tied to the Division. In all the PowerPoint chaos of the Series 12 finale, this aspect was kind of forgotten, but it comes back in full force in Flux, forming one of the many big plot threads. Once Upon Time gives us a tantalising glimpse at a Division operation, the Fugitive Doctor leading a squad to liberate the Temple of Atropos in exchange for her own freedom. It's a brilliant twist when she shows up, continuing to represent the 13th Doctor's lack of memories from her past. Rather than introducing more new incarnations, they stick with the Fugitive Doctor, so it works well as a recognisable indicator of her place within the timeline. You see her and instantly know where she fits in. Also, there's just a great dissonance as the squad members are replaced by Dan, Yaz and Vin the three of them absolutely rocking those Division outfits and guns. I'd honestly love a whole show like this, full of the Doctor Who edginess I've been missing since Torchwood ended. Come on, where's my Division spin-off? Big finish at least? Maybe? Hopefully? One day? The next instance of the Division is in Village of the Angels, where we discover that the organisation uses squads of weeping angels for certain tasks like the ambiguously named Quantum Extraction. Now initially this whole idea seems ridiculous. I mean their nickname is literally the Lonely Assassins. They work for themselves and themselves alone. They're too powerful to be manipulated like a lesser being, so it would seem like an insulting move to suddenly make them answer to a higher power. However, this is actually the perfect decision, because it represents the sheer power of the Division. The Time Lords haven't been a mysterious, powerful presence since the end of time, or maybe even the War Games. You don't really feel threatened by the idea of a Time Lord anymore because of all the goofy costumes they've had. But things like Harvinister's implant killing him if he divulges Division information is delightfully horrific and evil. He was literally the Doctor's companion. They went through thick and thin before she left, and he has been forced to bottle that up, having to constantly live with that pain. It shows the cruelty of the Division and makes the Time Lords very intimidating again. Suddenly dropping this bomb that the Division is influential and powerful enough to bend even the Weeping Angels to their will changes everything you thought you knew about the organisation. The fact that the Angels don't usually ally with anyone makes the reveal work. It doesn't lessen the Angels, it strengthens the Division. They're everywhere, able to use literally whoever and whatever it needs to achieve its goals. Which opens up so many dark possibilities about who could have been the part Puppet Masters behind some of the Doctor's biggest confrontations. 
Indeed, the big reveal in Survivors of the Flux is that the division is now led by none other than Tech Taeyun, the Doctor's own adoptive mother. Remember, from the Timeless Children? I hope you were paying attention to that PowerPoint presentation. It turns out that despite being given all the regeneration energy in the world, Tech Taeyun really doesn't like her daughter anymore, creating the Flux and releasing the Ravages to destroy the universe all because of the Doctor's constant meddling and I thought the Gallagher brothers were bad. You'd think it would be the opposite, since the time as children implied Tectoon kept killing the Doctor to make them regenerate in order to harness the power for herself. For some reason, Flux completely misses the opportunity to use this for character drama. Given that these experiments are some of the only things the Doctor actually now remembers from her secret past, she'd probably be a bit angrier and willing to hold her own motherly figure accountable for exploiting her this way, but it never even gets mentioned. Tectoon is a really weird villain of Flux, because she just shows up out of the blue and then immediately gets killed by the Ravagers. Now, don't get me wrong, I adore the irony of her being killed by her own hubris, underestimating Swarm and Azure's power and ambition. It's a fun turning of the tables, but her suddenly getting yeeted out of existence like this feels really sudden. In Once Upon a Time, it's all, ooh, who is this mysterious woman? Then Survivors of the Flux goes, oh yeah, it's Tech Taeyun. But then in the same episode, she gets killed, which makes you wonder why she was even written into the story to begin with. For the supposed architect of this whole thing, she doesn't come across as the huge manipulative villain the show wants you to see her as. She's instead just an exposition machine there to tell you about the division and her weird plan to travel into another universe to start anew. It's so strange and out of place because there's already so much else to deal with. After hyping up the division for the whole series, it all suddenly gets sidelined because Chibnall also needed to wrap up his whole timeless child story. Oh wait, that doesn't get resolved because the Doctor has the chance to see all her memories but instead throws away the watch. So why was half the series about all this? After the huge reveal of the timeless child in series 12, it seemed like her exploring her origins would form the basis for the rest of her tenure, but instead it becomes just like the promise of the 12th Doctor spending series 8 looking for Gallifrey. Is that what I'm supposed to do now? Go looking for Gallifrey? Well, it's entirely up to you. Just for it to get ignored until the epilogue of the finale. I understand what Flux was trying to do with the Timeless Child and Division storyline. The Doctor is desperate for answers, with Swarm and Tectone constantly treating her like her old selves they used to know, rather than the current person she is. They are always pushing her to embrace her past, which is what leads her to reject it all because she's happy with who she is and doesn't want to be defined by that past, since that would be letting her enemies win in a way. She basically just wants the choice between whether she wants her memories back or not. You get all these characters trying to force it into her, so when she finally gets the fob watch at the end, she chooses to throw it away because she never cared about who she actually was, she just wanted the choice. On paper, all this looks fine, but it's pretty much exactly what we already saw in The Timeless Children. So none of these character beats are brand new. It's such a disappointment after we were promised so much. Doctor Who Flux was billed as the Doctor's biggest adventure, an epic six-part story that would change everything we knew about the show. I think this tweet from one of my Discord members sums it up perfectly. I expected Long Barrow, but instead got stolen Earth's journey's end. Rather than really experimenting with this unconventional style to do something the show has never done before, it just returns everything to the status quo. Even if it would have been a disaster, pressing ahead with some abstract story would have been a lot more interesting to watch, but instead it becomes yet another traditional story we've seen hundreds of times before. Think of everything people expected Flux to be. People were expecting a reveal of the Doctor's parents, her original species. We thought we might finally have that big memory gap revealed. We had these villains from her secret past, and constant teases of the division, culminating in a literal fob watch containing all the memories dangled in front of us back in the time as children. We as an audience expect to explore all that lore. Survivors of the Flux even shows us the potential of moving into an entire new universe. Imagine how much of a revolutionary step that would have been for Doctor Who. It would have been a really bold and creative move to make, changing pretty much everything about the show. I'm not saying I would have liked it, but the fact Flux ignores all these kinds of opportunities makes it frustrating, because it descends right back into what we're used to. It doesn't progress the timeless child storyline, it doesn't answer the burning questions, or completely revolutionise the show like it could have done. Doctor Who has always taken big risks. Changing the lead actor? Big risk. Introducing the Doctor species? 
big risk. Grounding the time and space traveller on modern day Earth, a big risk and it saved the show. All throughout the show's history, it has had to reinvent itself to keep going and maintaining interest. Even expanded media has experimented heavily, with audios like Zagreus. Doctor Who Flux was the best opportunity since the revival, the show had to develop a new identity, but it was too scared to do it. Instead, the new identity is just the structure and only that. The stories and characters stay the same. Flux didn't tell the narrative fans wanted and instead played things too safe, preventing the kind of rejuvenation the show has been aching for for years as it continues to fall out of the public consciousness and become lost in the media landscape. Part 10. A Redemption or Falling Further When you look at the viewing figures of Doxy Series 13, your first thought would be alarm at the low numbers, with Village of the Angels the least watched episode of the entire revived era, sitting at a lowly 4.55 million, taking the crown of shame from Timeless Children's 4.69 million. Nice. It paints a pretty damning picture, something a number of fans have repeatedly pointed to as a way of suggesting the show itself is dying. However, viewing figures have never been this black and white. There are always a myriad of factors. You have to take chart placement and audience share into account. Halloween Apocalypse was watched by 5.81 million but charted 8th for the week as the third most watched drama. Spyfall Part 1, the previous series opener, got over a million more viewers yet landed at 8th on the chart with roughly the same audience share. This show shows a much more balanced picture, especially when you delve deeper into the charts and see that Science in the Library was the worst performing episode of Modern Doctor Who until Sleep No More. In fact, the lowest Doctor Who has ever charted in all its history was the 1980 Tom Baker episode Full Circle Part 2. It had 3.70 million, which is about a million less than Flux's average. But where did it come? 170th. Yes, 169 other shows were watched more that week despite there only being 3 channels to choose from. Compare that to 2021, where there is so much competition, especially from streaming services, which have been eaten away at traditional broadcast numbers for years now. But hang on a minute, oh look, Loki's premiere was only watched by 2.5 million people in its first 5 days, despite Disney Plus having a user base nearly twice the size of the entire UK population. Guess we better cancel Loki then, right? Clearly it isn't popular. Flux actually charted better than almost all of Series 12 and placed similar to Series 3, which if anything indicates more interest. Even the stretch of episodes between Age of Steel and Fear Her never got higher than 15th in the chart despite the popularity of Series 2 and higher viewer counts than Series 13. That's how ridiculous it is to suggest that Doctor Who is currently on the verge of cancellation. It's actually doing quite healthy all things considered, still within the top 30. Okay, so some of you will listen to that and go, well, viewing figures are one thing, what about the AI numbers? AI stands for Audience Appreciation Index. It's basically a metric to measure what the general public are watching on TV and what they think of it, scoring everything they watched in the past week out of 10, with that final number being times by 10 to score out of 100. Again, much like the viewing figures, when you look at the AI of Flux, it looks like something to be worried about, but it really isn't. AI is used to see whether shows with lower viewing figures have a good enough reception to remain on the air. Doctor Who still has very high ratings for British TV, so it doesn't really need to worry about what AI score it gets. A show like Hawkeye, on the other hand, might be held in close scrutiny because of its 1.5 million viewer base. And even though the AI for Doctor Who has been on a downward trend under Chimnal, a floor of 75 out of 100 is still good enough to show executives that Doctor Who is popular. And to be brutally honest, audience appreciation for Doctor Who just can't be trusted. This is the exact same system that gave Rose and End of the World the same as Love and Monsters. It gave Midnight an 86, tied as the lowest of Series 4 with Unicorn and the Wasp. Do you think that makes sense? Amy's Choice scored a measly 84, whilst The Lodger got an 87. To really show how unreliable it is, somehow Asylum of the Daleks scored a whopping 89 rating, which is higher than any other Smith era episode apart from The Big Bang. You don't usually tend to see many people claiming Asylum of the Daleks is one of the greatest episodes of modern Doctor Who. Similarly, Time of the Doctor sits at just 83, which is the same as The Caretaker and only one point above The Timeless Children. But the real kicker? The single worst audience appreciation index decision in Doctor Who history? Heaven Sent at 80 out of 100. 
That puts it lower than all of Series 10 and most of Series 11, especially being lower than Arachnids in the UK. No, that wasn't a joke. Do you honestly think this is a reliable indicator of quality? Taken out of context, both the AI and the viewing figures for Flux look really bad. Once you actually look at them properly, you'll see that the show is doing just fine. We already know it's been commissioned for a 60th anniversary special and another series, so right now there really isn't anything to worry about. Yes, like I mentioned way back in the marketing section of this video, former Doctor Who showrunner Russell T Davis has been appointed again, set to take over from Chibnall in 2023. The future is pretty much in the most capable hands possible, and a big question is whether Davis will continue down this path of serialisation. After all, once he left Doctor Who, he went on to write a number of critically lauded serialised dramas, and he might want to completely change up his style of Doctor Who this time around. The announcement of Davis' return ahead of Series 13 did take the spotlight, but it also provided the show with two things. Firstly, a big increase in public attention, because of how popular the first Davis era was. And secondly, a safety net. From a viewer's perspective, the future of the show was already secured, so there was no immediate threat of cancellation, and we could all view Flux as a nice experiment to see how viable the show could be in a serialised format. And regardless of the issues, the further fracturing of the fanbase and the questions of viewership, Flux was very enjoyable in the moment. Whether you wanted to see the next big moment or the next disastrous episode, everyone was invested in one way or another. It was fresh and gripping as it aired, but it'll probably age terribly now that it's finished and you can detach yourself from the novelty of it all. I mean, it's non-stop action full of deep lore and confusing explanations coming at you at 100 miles per hour, so consuming 6 straight hours of that would probably be a nightmare and you need to have TARDIS wiki on hand so you can actually understand what's happening. Despite all the rumours and claims of Chibnall having a 5 year plan, I think his era of Doctor Who is the bumpiest and least planned out period of the whole modern show. We started with series 11, which is essentially a complete reboot without any connection to the previous 10 series, refusing to use existing villains or multi-part stories. But when you get to series 12, it's suddenly an overload of deep cut references, returning villains like the Jadoon, Cybermen and the Master, along with the return of Captain Jack for no real reason. And and then you reach series 13, which is basically incomprehensible to someone new to the show because of all the crazy division and timeless child lore. Series 12 felt like a desperate course correction, so series 11 feels completely irrelevant to series 13. It's easy to speak with hindsight, but the main problem with Flux is that it had to squeeze three series worth of narrative into one because there didn't seem to be a proper long term plan in place. Everything about it seems like it should have been the final series in a trilogy of narrative dramas because of how much is going on and how much needs to be paid off in the finale. A bloated cast of underused characters, random irrelevant plot threads introduced in the penultimate episode, muddled villain motivations, a hard to follow narrative communicated mostly through exposition. These are all significant flaws of Flux. It's undeniably a structural mess. But to be honest, it's a fun mess with a lot to love about it. To me, it just simply feels like Doctor Who. So this brings me to the sentence that sums up the video. The redemption of Doctor Who. Why would I call Doctor Who Flux a redemption with all the huge negatives that cannot be ignored? Well, to put it simply, it worked for me. I was never shy in my absolute disdain for series 11 and 12. And it's understandable that those two dumpster fires damaged the Chimnal Era's reputation so much, people didn't even give it a go, or they made their minds up before they even watched. It. The past 5 or so years of Doctor Who alienated a lot of fans for all sorts of different reasons, but Flux did enough right that people like myself were able to reconcile with the show. It brought a lot of fans back into the fold, if only because of the freshness and intrigue of it all. It felt a little bit more fun to be a Doctor Who fan again. Well, that's if you ignore the arguments and bullying the fanbase had on the hellscape known as Twitter. There were memes like the bane of my existence, Evil Dan, aka the most overdone Doctor Who meme since Benny. People were sharing and wacky theories and getting excited or emotional over plot developments and cliffhangers. I was able to sit on the sofa every Saturday night with a bowl of sweets and lose myself in this intergalactic epic. Obviously I picked up on plot holes and continuity errors like everyone else. Obviously I found myself a bit confused at times, but unlike series 11 and 12, I just didn't care. I found myself able to overlook these issues because I was having fun with it. I don't even mind the finale too much. Is it a mess that completely rejects what I wanted from the series? Yes but it was fast, punchy and felt like enough of an echo of the Doctor Who I grew up with that I could still have a great time with it and feel pretty satisfied by the end. There was something within Flux that captured and gripped me. I wouldn't go so far as to say it had heart, because the characterization is still so wonky and mismanaged. 
but the serial had enough passion and ambition in it to make me feel like a kid again, or as close as I could be ever since I started making a living ripping apart my own childhood. Doctor Who means something different for everyone. No two fans have the exact same view of the show. I can easily understand why Flux would be absolutely hated by some fans and beloved by others. The show is just that Marmite these days. Flux didn't hit the right points for me in many departments because it threw away a golden opportunity to truly experiment with the show and I'll always wish it had done things differently. However, everything about Flux was such a clear improvement on what came before that I was able to take it as an earnest attempt at something bigger and cut it some slack, especially because the whole thing wasn't the original plan and was instead cobbled together in the midst of a global pandemic. Flux has some amazing stuff. You had the Sontarans becoming a legitimate threat again. You had great characters like Vinda and Jericho. Some of the effects were absolutely astonishing and worthy of competing with huge shows like The Expanse. The Doctor finally started feeling like the Doctor, and the serialization kept you guessing and wondering what could possibly happen next in such a chaotically beautiful mess. It still tried to experiment, it just didn't handle itself in the right way, and instead became a big missed opportunity. But with the second Russell T Davis era looming, Doctor Who Flux was able to reconnect with the roots of the show and embrace the chaos to go out in a memorable way, for better or for worse. And to me, that's a redemption. It hasn't magically redeemed the whole Chibnall era, but it finally gave me something to enjoy. Instead of just wanting the show to be put out of its misery and fade away, I'm now hopeful and excited for the future. And Flux played a big part of that. So here's to you Flux. You kind of failed, but you failed so spectacularly that you ended up succeeding enough. And I'd like to give an extra special thank you to my Diamond Level Patron, Fallon Cortez, and all my Gold Level Patrons. Alex Marston, Basil Disco PhD, Calvin, Daniel Shilito, Francois AK Line Vortex, George, Herna Verzog, and Stefan Neva Miller. Thank you so much for your support.